On July 27th, 2020, Patch 5.0 was released for StarCraft II, ten years exactly after the game's initial release as Wings of Liberty. What was shown off at the time to be a celebration of the game proved to be an admirable attempt for a swan song, as on October 15th of the same year an update on the game was released announcing an end of production for additional four purchase content. The effective end of support. While it may not be reasonable to proclaim the game is dead, at least depending on what a game being dead really means, it is entirely reasonable to proclaim the game to be final. While updates may continue, what they will be does not include dramatic balance changes or new abilities. The game is now what it will likely be forever. So let's talk about co-op missions. Co-op Missions was a game mode introduced to StarCraft II with the release of Legacy of the Void on November 10th, 2015. Originally known as Allied Commanders, Co-op Missions was added to be a bridge between the three campaigns and the regular multiplayer. The premise of the mode is this, various characters from the plot of the game are selectable as commanders. Each commander is a set of varying units and abilities appropriate to their character. Two different commanders are paired up, you cannot both have the same commander, and they fight a computer player in service of whatever goal the map has. The maps themselves are largely adapted from corresponding maps from the campaigns and thereby are objective based. The setting of these maps is the end war of Legacy of the Void, except explicitly non-canon, sometime after the third mission but before the epilogue. Upon the completion of a map, you will gain experience, the amount of which depends on varying factors such as difficulty, whether the map was random, whether you got the bonus objective, and occasionally other sources. Upon reaching the appropriate amount of experience, a commander will level up. Each level gives the commander a new unit or ability, something that makes the commander stronger and thereby more capable of handling higher difficulties and the weekly mutation. Co-op missions is my personal favorite mode in StarCraft II. A lot of it comes down to the mindset the game mode operates under. A competitive multiplayer mode comes packed with certain necessities. The game needs to have reasonable units and abilities to both use and respond to. There's inherent mind games catching your opponent off guard. But at the most fundamental level, it needs to be fair. Co-op doesn't have you competing against another human player. As a result, it has absolutely no reason to be fair. There are many aspects about a round of co-op that are random, but nothing is ever a surprise. Attack waves are consistent when they spawn and are broadcasted to you when they launch, barring the occasional mutator that may change that. The game will even tell you what type of enemy waves you'll encounter once you first spot them. Enemy waves themselves amass into massive balls of death incarnate, piles of units that not only exceed what you'd expect to find in any engagement within regular multiplayer, but with outright stronger units to boot. However strong these forces seem at face value, they are clearly and distinctly overcome by the might of the commanders. All the commanders are broken, the strength of them exceed anything reasonable that could be put into a PvP game. Unkillable units, instant full screen map teleporting, casual screen nukes galore. In my history of playing this mode, I can recall only three times they've ever nerfed a commander, that being specifically Kerrigan's Mutilus, Stepman's Infestors, and Tychus P2. On top of the general higher power level is the benefit of always having a partner to cover you. Any mistake you make or general shortcoming you could have can and often are covered by your partner making for an incredibly forgiving mode with many viable strategies. It's just a chill mode. The commanders are all varied, the maps are distinct, you have options to make the game a lot harder if you want to. It's just a good mode. So let's discuss it. Upon the initial release of the mode, the game had six commanders with five unique maps to play. As of now, there are 18 commanders with 15 unique maps to play. Each commander can be played up to level 5 for free. To level past that, the commander must be purchased. Excluding varying other ways, a commander could have been unlocked over the game's lifespan. There are three commanders that are free to all players, with all other commanders costing $5 each. 
There are no bundles for these commanders, providing a discount for buying them in bulk, which is stupid. But over the course of the four years they were actively releasing them, it wasn't an unreasonable price tag. Among these commanders, there are six for each race of the game, all varying in playstyle arranged in the menu by their release. Before assessing any commander, the systems of mastery and prestige must be discussed. Upon reaching the max level of 15 for a commander, you gain access to two systems for continued progression. The first and most obvious is the mastery system. This is an account-wide level you get for any and all max level commanders. From level 1 to level 90, you gain mastery points that you can allocate to the commanders in varying power sets. Each point you allocate benefits the commander in some way. Increased stats, increased cooldowns, decreased costs, etc. After level 90, you enter the Ascension System, which continues your leveling to a max of 1000, but has no benefits to your commanders. The experience threshold increases every level until level 90, when it drops to a consistent 200,000 experience per level until max. The benefits of mastery are very significant to a number of commanders and are very important to know in any analysis. The second system made available at level 15 is the Prestige System. Added in the game in patch 5.0, Prestige allows you to reset a commander to level 1, with the benefit of unlocking a Prestige you can equip. These Prestiges are meant to change the way the commander plays by giving them a noteworthy buff, while simultaneously giving them a noteworthy nerf. Almost no prestiges are outright better than the base commander, only different. At their best, they make a commander more specialized, allowing them to perform better for a specific role. While each prestige has a formal name, I will be referring to each prestige as P1, P2, or P3 respectively, depending on the order they unlock. With all that addressed, let us quickly assess all the commanders. Rainer is the Free Terran Commander. Designed as a representation of Wings of Liberty, he has access to some of the most basic strategies you will implement in that campaign. The Marine Marauder Medic Combo is a basic infantry corps that goes extremely far and is incredibly easy to comprehend. The benefits of the Medic specifically allow for army healing of both bio and mech, which is incredibly good for this mode and tends to help out your ally more often than not. This unit comp is supplemented by his ability to deploy units at the rally point of the production facility in question. Combined with the short training time of these units, you have a commander that can continually pump out large amounts of units and have them enter the fight immediately. This ability is however necessary, as the Marine Marauder Medic combo suffers from one glaring flaw, being extremely frail. With Marines having some of the lowest health for any unit in this mode, it won't take much to overcome the healing rate of the medics in your army. Threatened by any of the area effect spells and attacks the enemy will have and the general higher power of what you'll be up against, your army will poof out of existence without incredible care and generally relies on you immediately replacing all of your casualties in a kind of quantity over quality, horde mass style of strategy. Other options for Raynor's army do exist and have their niches. Firebats can be added to the basic infantry core for splash and a tad bit more durability when fighting things like Zerg. Rainer Mech is an acquired style, having access to not only tried and true basic mech units like siege tanks for any ground and vikings for any air respectively, his access to vultures and spider mines thereby give him an interesting tech option. But most notably, his battlecruisers are the supreme basic Terran unit and an incredibly effective unit to mass for a beginner, early game and particular enemy compositions notwithstanding. On the tech side, he's generally basic, with the most notable feature being his Orbital Command Center and Orbital Supply Depots, the former being a good way to build up resources through mules, and the latter allowing for a reduced amount of effort at managing your supply. One detriment of his tech is that his only available detection is scans from his Orbital Command Centers. As the vast majority of enemy compositions use some form of cloaking on higher difficulties. This is an incredibly awkward necessity, but nowhere near a deal breaker. He also has access to advanced bunkers, but they're bad outside of gimmicks, so don't use them. Rainer has two top bar calldowns, which may just be the most basic calldowns in the game. Banshee Airstrike summons multiple advanced banshees in a target area of effect. 
and then just wrecks havoc for a minute before going back on call down. These are passable panic buttons, something you can use should your main army be out of position and you need to attack something, either an attack wave or the main objective. Hyperion is powerful, but even that generally can't take out a base on its own. Getting the most out of these means pairing them up with your army for extra damage, specifically for pushing into enemy bases while using your call-down units to absorb the damage in the process. Raynor's masteries aren't game-changing, but they have their value. Reduced research cost is generally always good on a commander, but speed increase for drops helps with their spammy nature of his gameplay. Reduced cooldowns on Hyperion and Banshee airstrikes are nice to have, and additional medic healing or mech attack speed have obvious benefits depending on what your planned build is. The more interesting thing to note is his prestiges. P1 removes his mules and instead doubles the health of all Raynor infantry. While mules are incredibly effective at the job of mining minerals, they are a tech option that requires more skill to use. This prestige makes his army more durable, which is one of Raynor's main weak points, with the only cost being a more straightforward economy. While it may not be the best for pros, and other strats like Vulture Spider Mines are severely hurt with the loss of mules, this is an incredibly effective prestige for the most obvious way to play this commander, and easily the most common prestige I've seen for him. P2 exists, I guess. It makes units cost a bit more in exchange for what can be reasonably described as stim for mechs. It's useful for high level mech builds, I guess, but I've never seen it used by a competent player. P3 is effectively specialization into battle cruisers. It removes the tech requirement and gas cost to starports, makes starports units cost less gas, and reduces your top bar cooldowns the more starport units you have with the detriment being your units cost more minerals. While theoretically you could use this with Vikings and Banshees, I don't know why you would, its purpose is to turbo out battle cruisers. The issue with this playstyle is even with the benefits it gives you for this strategy, it's still terribly slow. While P3 makes the rush more viable, you're still going to be hurting early game. Kerrigan is the free Zerg commander and my personal favorite Zerg commander in the game. Like Raynor before her, she is a representation of her respective campaign, Heart of the Swarm, with a basic core of Zerg units that you would expect to find. The Zergling Hydralisk Ultralisk combo is a classic core of Zerg ground forces. Mutalisks are a tried and true air unit with access to self healing and bouncing attacks for larger groups and were at one point the strongest army unit in this entire mode with increasing power every bounce. A couple options like Broodlords which aren't good and Lurkers for an interesting defensive option are here as well. A recommended composition for Kerrigan is massing Hydralisks with supplementing Lurkers should the map call for it. The problem with Kerrigan's army is that it's not durable. Zerglings are the frailest unit in the game by design, and her better units like the Hydralisk and Mutalisk, while not frail per se, aren't extremely durable either. Mutalisks in particular suffer from splash as they tend to clump up, and while Ultralisks can help an army of Hydralisks by soaking up damage and then reviving themselves, their bulk makes this role in an army questionable. At first glance, while it may seem like this army is going for a standard Zerg approach of a large, replaceable army, it flounders in their ability to quickly rebuild. Kerrigan does not have an increased larva spawn rate over regular multiplayer, unlike all other Zerg commanders reliant on larva. While queens can help with this to a degree, the intention still is to make sure that your army survives. And there is one major tool for this. Kerrigan is one of the two only commanders in the game without any top bar abilities, which isn't that much of a detriment. In honor of how you use her in Heart of the Swarm, here you get to control Kerrigan personally on the battlefield. Equipped with multiple abilities ripped straight out of the campaign, and some that aren't, Kerrigan is, without exception, the strongest hero unit in co-op. Her power level is ridiculous, comical at times. The Assimilation Aura ability is one of the very few ways to get more resources other than mining them in this mode. Combined with the casual screen nuke that is Immobilization Wave and the heavy amounts of single unit damage from Leaping Strike 
and area of effect damage from psionic shift, you can basically turn any attack wave or base into extra resources. The less obvious good thing about her is her ability to generate expendable carapace with every attack. A high enough leveled Kerrigan simply makes more life in an engagement than she loses by taking damage. And even if you've managed to get Kerrigan killed off due to poor micromanagement, she will revive at your main base in the course of a minute. It is not uncommon to see Kerrigan players forego building an army at all, and instead immediately invest in all Kerrigan related upgrades and solo the entire mission with just her. Even if the strategy is very questionable at a lot of stages, there is no stage barring an early rush where Kerrigan can't carry the map alone for the opening portion. This allows you to focus on getting your base up and army built to a level that you would feel comfortable with. In this sense, Kerrigan is extremely friendly to beginner players. General tech for this commander is fairly generic, basic upgrade caches for all our units respectively. The ability Malignant Creep buffs all allied units to have increased attack speed and Zerg life regen while on creep. This combos well with certain other commanders, but if we're being realistic, isn't that noticeable. The arguably strongest tech option she has is the Omega Worm, which allows her to summon a detecting Nidus Worm anywhere within vision free from your Nidus network through a cooldown. This is generally regarded as one of the best things Kerrigan has, providing unit travel as well as detection and creep, but I personally don't care about it. Mastery for this commander are game-changing. They are incredibly significant and extremely difficult picks to make. Buffs to Kerrigan's energy and outright damage proved to make her better than she already was. Vespine cost down is a godsend to her army and absolutely makes getting to max supply easier while the improved immobilization wave is better for a solo Kerrigan build. And lower costs on all research to a max of 60%, letting you steamroll quickly through all of your research and immediately get out of your army versus even stronger abilities is one heck of a King Solomon-like decision for any player. Kerrigan's prestiges are also above average. P1 specializes to people like me who hate Omega Worms. They buff Malignant Creep and Creep Tumor spreading with it in exchange for losing worms. This combos very well with a Stuke off, but is otherwise unremarkable. P2 specializes in Kerrigan, turning an attack speed up mechanic she had into an area of effect army killer but makes her a bit frailer to balance out. And P3 is god tier because it makes her human, gives her new primary abilities, one of which lets her nuke air, and doubles her resource aura which wasn't even necessary to make people to want to play it but they gave it to her anyways. Artanis is the free Protoss commander. Being a representation of Legacy of the Void, Artanis adopts multiple abilities that you could have had in that campaign, as well as a large bundle of Ire faction units. At a certain level, Artanis happens to have the weakest army in the mode. At a max supply of 200, the army simply doesn't do as much as most other commanders. Everything you'd want in a basic Protoss army is here, but not much else. Zealots and Dragoons are standard for what you'd expect to be using in the campaign. High Templar are present with High Archons allowing for your standard Psystorm shenanigans you'd expect to find with some Protoss commander, though this strategy is very high gas. Other units like Immortals and Reavers are good against ground, while Phoenix and Tempests are good against air. A classic beginner strategy of build the biggest unit you have and mass them is very much viable with the Tempest, though splashing in Zealots as a mineral dump will help with this strategy. A solid army for general play is the classic Zealot Dragoon combo ripped straight out of StarCraft 1, with Immortals splashed in to counter armed forces should it be necessary. The main thing about this commander that is notable is his tech, specifically his ability to warp in units and guardian shell. Artanis can place down a field of pylon power anywhere on the field within your vision. To combo up on this, he gains access to the ability to build his units anywhere in pylon power, of which they spawn almost instantly. This allows him to consistently reinforce his army, and other plays like deliberately spawning a load of zealots in the heart of the enemy base to absorb the enemy's focus while you and your army swoop in is a classic move Artanis pulls off. The other even more impactful ability he has is Guardian Shell. Ripped straight out of the campaign, Guardian Shell makes any unit that was about to die temporarily invincible, allowing for that unit to finish the fight, run away, or receive healing from your ally respectively. 
This ability also affects your ally, and for a large portion of them is a massive game changer and a huge spike in power. Novas absolutely love being paired with an Artanis. Other cooldowns he has aren't too important. Orbital Strike helps, but almost isn't even worth the energy to use. Shield Overcharge is great for extra durability, and Solar Bombardment is a very effective screen nuke. The rest of his tech is incredibly standard in what you'd expect to find on a commander like this. The most notable thing left being a starting supply of 200 at max level. Artanis' masteries are not overly significant. More durability for shield overcharge is okay, but you pick it because the life restored through Guardian Shell Mastery isn't too important for the long game. Energy up or speed for warped in units depends on what build you're planning, and isn't too significant either. Then at the end, Chrono Boost up or more energy is a standard Protoss Mastery set. Artanis' prestiges aren't the best in the game either. P1 specializes in spellcasters, specifically High Templar slash High Archons, and the Zealots with their Whirlwind, though the increased cost makes building up early game more questionable. P2 is the general consensus for his best prestige, allowing for map teleporting with your pylon energy fields, while simultaneously stacking with his speed increased for warped in units mastery, as the teleport counts in as them warping in. And P3 is a meme. Swan is the second Terran commander and he is primarily focused around two things. Mechanical units and a laser drill. Starting with his units, Swan simply doesn't have a barracks, something the game likes to point out with him. To counteract this, the tech requirement for the factory is removed along with the building's Vespine cost. The idea is simple, start with mech units. Most players go a combination of goliaths for damage and science vessels to support them through healing and shielding. This is the general core of his army. Other units like Thor's can be splashed in for raw power, though they make macroing harder. Siege tanks are good for specific scenarios, cyclones if you want a meme. An effective strategy that the best of swans do is the combination of the Hercules transport ship and sieged siege tanks. Having you teleport in, drop them, then pick them up when the fight is over, though this strategy is very micro-intensive, not overly necessary, and I just don't know. Wraiths also exist and are fine, I guess. The big thing about Swan is his access to the laser drill. The drill will lock onto any enemy unit within sight range and start doing damage. The amount of damage can be upgraded, yet in the moment it will be hard to notice a significant benefit of the drill, as it only ever targets one unit without prestige. But the real benefit of the upgrading is gaining access to a full screen death beam and a screen nuke respectively. The only other top bar ability Swan has is his combat drop, which is reminiscent of Raynor's Banshee drop, only that these bots are a lot more durable and go much further in advancing plays. Aside from the drill, Swan has some of the most interesting tech around for a Terran commander. Vespian harvesting drones are one of the very few ways to earn both you and your ally extra resources, which makes Swan a godsend for most other commanders. Tech reactors are very nice. Immortality Protocol helps keep your Thors and siege tanks alive for whatever that's worth. And the advanced construction for SEVs allow you to pump out buildings fast, which is very good as a supplement to not having instant supply depots like Rainer. Swan also has access to a lot of turrets. He arguably has access to the best statics in all of co-op. But given statics are usually a bad game plan, it doesn't account for much. Another thing to know about Swan is his extremely high ramp up time. He starts off with more expensive units, and those units aren't the most competent outside of mass. As a result, Swan takes a bit before he starts rolling. A stronger early game commander is usually a good partner for Swan as a result. His masteries are significant, but only just. More damage to the top bar is fine, though most players are running more life for combat drops now because of a certain prestige. Health structure pretty much exists for turret builds, but given that's an inferior playstyle to just building an army... Eh. The biggest thing is the reduced cost of Vespine drones. With a max cost down of 90%, what would cost you 100 minerals each early game, now only costs 10 and becomes quick and easy to get out. Gas for the most part is the most scarce resource a commander will come across, so capping that early on generally helps all parties. Though there are some heavy mineral builds you could go, I guess. 
In regards to his prestiges, some get more love than others. P1 is the most common swan you will find as it removes his top bar drill abilities, all of the beam and nuke, and replaces it with a buffed drill that provides splash and slow with its shots. This effect is more significant than it first appears and really helps out early game encounters as well as supports their engagements consistently throughout the game. The removal of the abilities also makes this prestige more beginner friendly in a possessed backwards kind of way. P2 is specialization into his turrets, which makes Swan arguably the best turret defense commander in the game, but static still sucks, so whatever. P3 is an acquired playstyle specializing in Hercules, allowing you to teleport your army easier around the map and bring your science vessels with them, though it's a bit more trouble than it's worth and you don't usually see this. Zagara is the second Zerg commander and is commonly described as playing Zerg on ladder. The first and most obvious thing about her army is a reduced supply cap. Reaching a maximum of 100, she has half the maximum army size to all commanders discussed so far. At least without prestige, that is. This nerf is common to a lot of commanders in the game, but the general underlying theme is that they have souped up units requiring a lower supply ceiling to compensate. Zagara is not that. She is the pure distillation of Zerg Rush presented in the co-op missions mode. The recommended army is a core of mostly three units. Zerglings, Banelings, and Scourges. The latter two are suicide units that rush into the enemy and explode, causing massive damage and the former being a small, low health unit that you can pump out quickly and cheaply. The whole idea is a disposable mass. You zerg rush your opponent, casualties be damned, then immediately replace your forces for the next engagement. Some key features to note that makes this easier are her double drones and increased larva spawn rate. The double drones not only give her an incredibly fast economy, but also reduce the supply taken by said drones. The increased larva spawn assists in getting more units out, reducing the need for queens, though it's not uncommon to have hatcheries numbering around 8 for this commander by the end game. Another vital ability is her free banelings. By producing a baneling nest, Zagara automatically starts producing free banelings, stopped only when you run out of available supply. This one ability is critical to her game plan and represents a huge spike in power when first leveling her up. Other units technically also exist. Aberrations and Corruptors are her more sturdy ground and air options, and splashing them into your armies does help a bit, while the Bio Launcher has never been used outside of 300 IQ plays. Zagara, picking up a few tips from Kerrigan, does not have any top bar abilities. In their place, she has a hero unit, Zagara, who is without a doubt the worst hero unit in this mode. At a fundamental level, the biggest issue she has before mastery is energy regen, in that she basically doesn't have any. All her abilities are fine, I guess? But because you keep expending all your energy, you don't really have any opportunity to use these abilities repeatedly and consistently. Meanwhile, her regular attack is subpar. Left with a mediocre damage hero without the energy needed to continually use abilities and a not impressive HP stat to boot, you're basically just playing her Zerg Rush strategy without her. Special mention goes to Infested Draw for being a decent panic button and able to be cast anywhere on the map regardless of vision while being cooldown based and not energy. When it comes to masteries, Zagara benefits more than most. Zagara Energy Regen really does jumpstart this commander and makes her much more viable in use than she would be otherwise. Zergling Evasion is neat, though Frenzy is really strong, and an increase to Baneling damage is very nice to have when you're getting them for free. The big thing about Zagara, though, is her prestiges. P1 is basically the vast majority of Zagara players today, and with good reason. It specializes into Banelings and Scourges. For the surprisingly low price of losing your hero unit, you gain access to not only a higher max supply, but more free banelings and free scourges on the side. The amount of free units you get with this prestige is preposterous and leads to absolute anarchy. P2 specializes in aberrations, which is alright I guess, but you lose your free banelings so tread lightly, 
And P3 is my personal favorite because it gives Zagara a sick-ass skin. Also, it buffs her a lot, but come on, look at that skin. Vorazun is the second Protoss commander and last of the Day 1 commanders. As the matriarch of the Nerezin, her army is entirely composed of Nerezin faction units from the campaign. The first thing to note is the absence of the robotics facility, making her a quasi-swan in a sort of way. The general core of her army is the reliance on the Dark Templar, which specifically has a reduced gas cost from its regular counterpart. While the benefits of cloaking may seem valuable, in co-op you will almost never engage with an enemy without multiple sources of detection, some of which can't be immediately disposed of in an easy manner, i.e. observers, ravens, and overseers. What makes the Dark Templar powerful is a single ability ripped out of the campaign, Shadow Fury. This ability causes the unit to perform multiple quick strikes in an area, when grouped up, this ability absolutely decimates any and all ground units and is probably one of the most powerful unit abilities in the whole game. To supplement these units, Vorazun gives multiple benefits to cloaked units. Increased shield regen, increased damage, to outright being teleported away should fatal damage be taken. Dark Templar are very effective and generally should be tech to immediately, but they don't attack air. The most obvious choice to counter this is the Corsair. With the ability to permanently cloak via research, it's a very clear pick to cover this weakness. If they could actually kill air. Paired up against light targets, i.e. Zerg, they're fine for this, but put them up against carriers or battle cruisers, They might as well be anti-ground spellcasters for how little damage they do. The other option is the Stalker, basic ground shooter who happens to also be anti-armor, and therefore the best option in these scenarios. Sticking with Stalkers also lets you invest only in ground upgrades, saving the resources needed to invest in air. Her other units are more questionable. Her Zealot equivalent, the Centurion, is basically a worse DT and you shouldn't bother with it. The Dark Archon is way too expensive for how much he does, though I guess he's an interesting tech option. Void Rays are kinda just bad, and Oracles are a necessary evil because they are her only detection. A detection that moves faster than anything else she has, doesn't attack automatically, is extremely frail, and is extremely big-brained to actually use effectively. Probably my least favorite detection in the whole game. Her tech is all rather basic, her DT stuff is good, the rest is alright, with special mention of cloaking for Corsairs and Oracles. Her general commander abilities are where the really cool stuff is. Automatic refineries are always nice, Black Hole is a very useful top bar ability and actually negates armor with a level up. The Shadow Guard is a very reliable cooldown that tend to always do a good chunk of damage to the opponent. Dark Pylon is more helpful as a teleport option rather than a cloaker and Time Stop is one of the strongest nukes in the game, basically allowing a free win to any engagement you want as long as you're competent. Masteries for her aren't too significant. Black Hole Duration helps you give more time to kill your opponent, and you really shouldn't be using Dark Pylons for cloaking. Shadow Guard tends to stick around for the amount of time that they are actually useful, though increasing their duration is significant for a certain prestige and Power Set 3 is standard in Protoss Mastery. Vorazun's Prestiges are more interesting than her Masteries. P1 is Specialization into Emergency Recall, buffing that ability by making it fully heal any unit that gets recalled, and recalling to the nearest Nexus or Dark Pylon respectively, by losing your Dark Pylon Teleport. If you're like me, who tends to forget that Dark Pylons can teleport your units, this Prestige is basically a straight plus. P2 is specialization into Disruption Wave and is stupid and I don't like it. P3 is specialization into Time Stop and it's my favorite one. It gives Time Stop the added bonus of resummoning any Shadow Guard that you've made throughout the map when you activate it. This turns one of the best nukes in the game into an actual screen nuke, as 20 plus Hero Dark Templar are suddenly ripping the enemy to shreds alongside the Frozen Time. 
The only detriment to this ability is the reduced timer for the Shadow Guard, but Mastery raising their duration bypasses this issue. Karax is the third Protoss commander, the first commander added after the original six, and my favorite Protoss commander in the game. In a weird, almost not intended way, Karax happens to have it all. Starting with his army, he adopts a lot of the purifier group units from the campaign, but not entirely with the real motif being robotic units. All of his units have increased life over their campaign counterparts, making his army more durable. Combined with his ability of Reconstruction Beam, which auto-regenerates any and all mech for you and your ally, such as non-Zerg buildings and mechanical units respectively, he has an incredibly sturdy army, which is very welcome in this mode. The drawback is price. Base Karax has an increase of 30% cost to all of his units from their campaign counterparts. Furthermore, the selection of his army isn't entirely the best. His variant of the Zealot, the Sentinel, has the ability to resurrect itself upon death once every two minutes. Combined with increased health, this is a very capable damage sponge and a linchpin to any and all builds that involve an army. The Energizer is a very good support spellcaster who can hard counter battlecruisers with their mind control mech units ability if that's your jam. His robotics facility consists of Immortals and Colossi, which are heavy single target and splash respectively. But something you'll notice in this selection is no ground units attack air effectively. Energizers don't count. If you desire to go an all ground build, you have to buy the Shadow Cannon ability for the Immortals and perform some heavy micro to combat air. Of course, you can get his air units like Mirages, which have the same problem killing things as Corsairs, and the Carrier, which is an impressively bulky, high DPS unit but so expensive that it's extremely questionable to use without a certain prestige. Mass Carriers is also a popular build you can do with Karax though you rarely get anywhere close to max supply, again, without a certain prestige, and you have extremely poor early game as a result. The general recommended army is the all-ground comp. Zealots, Energizers, and Immortals respectively, with Colossi splashed in should that be called for. A big thing that helps him deal with air is his access to cannons. Now, statics generally aren't good in co-op. A competent army in the right position usually performs better. Karax isn't entirely immune to this rule, but he does have the most commendable access to offensive statics in the game. The commander ability to instantly deploy not only pylons, but the various types of statics that he has, a la photon cannons, monoliths, and shield batteries, allows Karax to walk into the enemy base and just build a turret defense to fight them. Combined with the self-heal from Reconstruction Beam, he is the best offensive static commander and one of the best defensive static commanders in the game, beaten out only by Swan due to the fact that his cannons lack any splash and as such have trouble with larger hordes. If this alongside his capable army wasn't enough for you, Karax has the strongest calldowns in the game. Being the honorary Nuke It from Orbit commander, he has access to not only orbital strikes with no cooldown, but the Solar Lance ability as well. Mix in the Purifier Beam, which is a guaranteed attack wave dead, and Chrono Wave for increased production to not only units, but research like increase your energy regen so you can use more calldowns. He basically becomes one of the more broken commanders in the game. Masteries for him were at one point game changing, now only alright. Extra unit life or extra structure life depends on what build you're doing. Better heal or extra energy from Chrono Wave also depends on preference. But extra energy is an absolute must and makes Karax a lot stronger early game than he would be otherwise. Karax's prestiges are basically a case study in how to do prestiges right. Every single one of them is a Hall of Famer. P1 is Cannon Specialization, making their auto regen better, giving them benefits from Unit Barrier, which is nice, and making Chrono Wave cause them to massacre the enemy at the cost of a sketchier army. P2 is Specialization into Army Units, giving a massive decrease in costs that makes the units cheaper than their campaign equivalents, while also leaving their increased HP. This makes his army a beast, it makes carrier spam viable, 
and the only cost being you lose cannons, which if you're playing army focused isn't that big an issue. P3's specialization into call downs, turning the game into a point and click adventure for the cost of slowing down your production. P3 is also essential for the fastest way to grind XP in the game, so that's something, I guess. Here comes my hot take. Abathur is the third Zerg commander and easily the strongest commander in the game. He is also the only commander besides the first three that is recommended for all skill levels. You see... A running motif of some of the stronger commanders is access to not only high HP and thereby durable units, but also the ability to heal in some manner and thus maintain your army. Your army is an investment. The longer you keep them alive, the more you get out of them. While there are many a commander that rely on cheaper, more replaceable armies, the monstrous, unkillable kind tends to go extremely far. Abathur is the purest distillation of this concept. The key feature of Abathur is his access to two specific units, the Brutalisk and the Leviathan. Known as Ultimate Evolutions, these are high HP, high damage units that get access to gems like Protective Carapace, Deep Tunnel, and aggro all nearby enemies so you can tank for your weaker units. These things are true monstrosities, and with the abundance of ways to heal with Abathur, mainly the buffed queens which actually fall into your F2 army, unlike Kerrigan and Zagara before him, and Mend, a top bar heal everything ability, an on-point player should never see any Brutalisks and Leviathans die, at least once fully leveled. Abathur is also my least favorite commander in the game. The problem I have with him stems from how you get these ultimate evolutions. When enemy units die, they drop biomass, the amount of which is directly related to the unit in question. Any combat unit you have can go and pick up this goo, making your units larger and effectively improving all of its stats, such as life, attack speed, and energy regeneration. Once you get a unit to a goo amount of 100, they turn into an ultimate evolution of their respective type. A ground unit turns into a Brutalisk, and an air unit turns into a Leviathan. You can only have three of each without a certain prestige. If you have your limit, they will just stop collecting goo at 100, in hot anticipation of turning into an ultimate evolution should one die. The ability to get a Brutalisk so early on is the reason why Abathur is so powerful. So here's my question. How do you kill the enemies needed to get a Brutalisk? Abathur's army without goo is pathetic. Skipping the spawning pool in a quasi-swan kind of way, he starts off with roaches. These roaches are worthless without goo, and only become valuable when supplemented with support like Brutalisks and Queens for healing. They are also the cheapest unit to build your Brutalisks out of, and generally prove to be a core unit of your army. Other units in his army have their roles. The Swarm Host is a fan favorite of Abathur players, though it's very micro-intensive and extremely expensive. Mutalisks are a core unit that you should definitely be using, but again, they're extremely weak without goo. Vipers are a cool tech choice for the 200 IQ players out there, and further evolutions to Roaches and Mutalisks tend to prove lacking for an actual power boost. Out of the gate, your army sucks. They suck so bad that the recommended way to open your expansion is to build statics to do it. You need the goo to make your army good. So again I ask, how do you kill enough units to make your army good? Abathur has two top bar abilities, Mend and Toxic Nest. Mend is a generic heal for all allied units and buildings, good for maintaining forces and your ally is unlikely to complain, but it's not offensive in any direct way. The other ability, and the way you're supposed to get goo, is Toxic Nests. These are proximity mines that you place. Once enemies run into them, they deal massive damage. With bonuses for mastery, these are extremely effective at killing forces. 
A secondary benefit they give is any unit that is hit by this mine also happens to drop extra goo. Add on that, they generate creep and can be placed anywhere you can see. They are secretly really good for maintaining map vision. A problem they have is that they need to be mined. You cannot spawn them on an enemy and deal damage. When they're spawning, they can be seen and killed. And regardless of what you do, they only hit ground. The general premise is you get a unit, or whatever, lay down a lot of these mines and lure the enemy into them to generate goo. While this is good in theory, this is incredibly micro-intensive, isn't the most intuitive thing to do on many maps, and in practice, most Abathur players I've encountered don't even bother trying for this. The more usual method is to place them in the way of the first attack wave. Said attack wave will be massacred and you can use this goo to jumpstart your army. Ignoring that this requires intimate knowledge of each map and the enemy wave's spawning habits, and thereby makes this unviable for new players, the first attack wave usually isn't enough for a brutalisk, is sometimes random depending on the stage, and if they send vikings after you, you're screwed. The best way to get that sweet, sweet goo is to rely on your ally to kill the starting enemies while you supplement their efforts with toxic nests. And if you're relying on the competency of your ally in a random queue to make your commander good, well, good luck, I guess. Another thing that really annoys me about him is the applying of the goo to individual units. The larger the army, the more units it has to go around. As such, if you need to make a leviathan later on in the game, you need to stop your ball of units, manually select an air unit, and have that one single unit go around and collect the goo, then presumably there's spare goo, so you have to move that unit back, select another unit, and collect the rest. It's just a huge pain in the ass. I remember the match that soured my opinion on this commander was a match on Oblivion Express. I knocked out the first attack wave, but it wasn't enough for a Brutalist. Left with only roaches, they did measly damage to the objective, ultimately resulting in us losing our first train and my ally yelling at me about it. He's just not as obviously self-reliant as I want commanders to be. The rest of his tech is fine, most unit upgrades are good, locust spawning from enemy deaths helps a bit, healing is everywhere, for masteries they help out a bit but they aren't too significant, toxic nest damage helps, Extra carapace from symbiote ability improvement makes your already unkillable units even more unkillable. More toxic nests help, I guess. His prestiges though, another hot take here, all suck. P1 is a joke because it specializes in your regular army. Raising the max goo amount to 125 in exchange for losing ultimate evolutions, which really hurts your army. P2 is the community fan favorite and the one I see the most as it specializes in swarm hosts, making their locusts better and giving a buff to deep tunnel, but it increases the gas costs of all your units which was already the rough part for playing swarm hosts. P3 is outright bad. A specialization into ultimate evolutions that somehow makes them worse. It removes the cap of 3 each but also halves the benefits of goo in general requiring you get 200 for one monster. There are very few exceptions where I have seen a P3 Abathur reach more than three of each type of ultimate evolution. The amount of enemies you fight generally doesn't get you that far. On top of which, it makes getting one out in the first place harder and your regular army just worse. In most circumstances, you will have more monsters without P3 than you would with it. Just don't play this prestige. Alarak is the fourth Protoss commander and the first with a hero unit. The core of his playstyle is said hero unit, Alarak. With a single target charge ability and an area of effect ability, he's very reminiscent of Kerrigan in some manners. What sets him apart is his soul absorption ability. When taking fatal damage, he can kill any nearby unit of his possession for a health restoration. Alarak also heals whenever a nearby enemy unit is killed. The other crucial ability he has is Empower Me. This gives Alarak a buff to all damage he deals, dependent on how many allied units are nearby him at the time. In the end game, Empower Me is a free win. Destruction Wave will destroy anything that's not a hybrid, and Deadly Charge will definitely kill the hybrid anyways. 
Even at earlier stages, just a few units really buffs up Alarak, and as a result, Empower Bee is an incredibly significant tool in his arsenal. Now, because Alarak loves eating all your units, he risks eating some of the more expensive units. To compensate, you have the Supplicant. This unit costs exclusively minerals and is pooped out in twos. He's also completely useless for dealing damage, but is core to Alarak's army. A Supplicant takes priority over all other units for Alarak's soul absorption, on top of which, what they lack in damage dealing, they make up for an extreme durability with some extraordinarily strong defensive upgrades you can get for them. This is good as the increase in units around benefits empower me, making them an excellent supplement to the hero unit they are supporting. Supplicants alone, however, are not good. As such, you need other units in your army. His stalker equivalent, the Slayer, is a decent ground unit that can attack air. Though they aren't the best, the Havoc is absolutely necessary because it's his only detection. His two robotics facility units of the Vanguard and Wrathwalker are more case specific than they seem at face value. Wrathwalker specifically is the only other unit that can attack air. Though you need to research it and with its ability to attack while on the move makes for some interesting micro options. The best unit he has is his High Templar equivalent, the Ascendant. The use of their psionic orbs is the best option Alaric has to knocking out most air and is part of the generally recommended army comp. Though using a spellcaster when you already have a hero unit is too micro-intensive for my taste. The last unit to note is the War Prism, which basically exists as a portable structure overcharge target, and not much else. For top bar abilities he has access to previously mentioned, Structure Overcharge. This turns any allied building into a photon cannon with varying degrees of power dependent on mastery allocation. This ability is particularly useful in opening your expansion early and is generally a nice way to deal with unprepared for attack waves. The other top bar ability is the Death Fleet, serving as his panic button. The Death Fleet summons a mothership and a couple destroyers to wreak havoc on the opponent. The mothership in particular is extremely powerful and has a notable ability of teleporting itself and nearby units to an allied building, though outside of P3 you're not going to be using that. On other tech he has is standard, most of the unit upgrades are fine, the exception to this being the Wrathwalker upgrades, which are essential if you're using that unit. Alarak's masteries aren't too significant, make Alarak or your army better depending on if you're using Ascendants or not. Empower me generally lasts as long as the enemy waves tend to, so increasing the duration doesn't help that much, but you'll pick that anyways because of the prestiges. And buffing structure overcharge is very good. Specifically note, 22 is the amount you need for one overcharge to clear the rock expansions. Alarak's prestiges are fairly good. P1 has its fans, but the loss of damage from Alarak's abilities overtakes any benefit I see from the buffed army. P2 is very good, and what you'll be using if you ever find yourself prestige leveling Alarak. Being able to use Empower Me more often is a huge buff and more valuable than base Alarak Death Fleet. P3 is the community favorite and is specialization into the Death Fleet, specifically the Mothership. With this prestige, you can just buy the Mothership, and with that, Destroyers. The Mothership is a ruthlessly powerful early game unit and with the teleport has a lot of utility to it as well. Destroyers are questionable as they're particularly frail and Alarak has no healing, but if you use P3 to just get a permanent mothership, it makes it better than his base state on that alone. Nova is the third Terran commander, the first with a hero unit, and my personal favorite commander in the game. Released in relation to the Story Maps DLC Nova Covert Ops, she is a good faith adaptation of said mini campaign in a manner like the first three commanders. The first obvious thing about her is the lack of any need to build supply depots, as well as a maximum supply of 100, half the usual amount. While the first commander to have this supply limitation uses it to establish a power ceiling to a cheap and frail army, Nova uses it as a power ceiling for an expensive and sturdy one. Nova has three production structures, she can only produce one of each. Each of these production structures has all available units running on a background queue. 
Rather than buying a unit and waiting for production to finish, all combat units are deployed immediately on the map where they are deployed upon purchase. The number of units you can purchase is not infinite. It depends on the available charges of the unit in question built upon automatically over the time in the background queue. Furthermore, the number of units you purchase tends to be in bunches. Most combat units result in two being produced, with marines creating four and ravens making only one. All these purchases are expensive, and given that they are finite throughout the match, two things will become clear when playing her. You must go a variety of units to build your army, as going just one or two limits the amount you will be able to produce. And second, any losses to your army will prove to be significant, as your units were not only expensive, but are not entirely within your ability to replace. As a result of these factors, Nova focuses heavily on sustainability and strategy at a micro level. Her army is varied in roles and best utilized as a counter to the composition of the enemy rather than one outright best build. The units of marines and marauders are the closest Nova has to staples. As cheap early game options, two batches of these units can generally manage any enemy composition for a solid enough amount of time for you to get your base set up and research prepared. The Marine in particular has access to self-healing stim packs, which is fairly significant for survivability. To move past this we have the Ghost, a very effective anti-bio unit. The research triple tap buffs his autocast snipe ability to make the Ghost the bane of most hybrid, though it falls off against mech builds and in some ways zerg as they waste their snipes on low value targets like zerglings. EMP round is also a thing, but it's a spell on a commander that already has a hero unit, so make of that what you will. The Hellbat is bad, don't use it. The Goliath is a very effective anti-air unit for Terran or Protoss, as they stun the enemy and make very scary units like the Battlecruiser a free kill, but fall off against Zerg as they can't stun their flyers. The Siege Tank has its fans, especially with their spider mines, but with their high gas cost, I personally only use them on particular maps where defense is called for. Liberators are arguably one of her best units, providing good splash for air to counter Zerg, as well as extremely high damage for ground targets, if you're smart enough to micro them. But the gas cost is high enough that you would have to dedicate yourself to them over other units. Banshees are more specific can only attack ground, but with their rocket barrage ability are very good at damage to ground and are cheaper than liberators. Finally, ravens are a staple of your army before mastery as they are Nova's only way to heal and have some other abilities that are strong if you're big brained enough to use them. Her army is case specific, a variety of strong options for a variety of scenarios. The last unit to note is her hero unit, Nova. Nova keeps a lot of abilities that you could equip with her in Nova Ops. To allow her to keep reasonable access to more than just two, they gave her two different modes, Stealth Mode and Assault Mode. Stealth Mode is always cloaked, though in higher difficulties this is basically irrelevant. In this mode, she has access to her Sniper Rifle and with it Snipe, a cooldown-based nuke, and a Sabotage Drone which is new to co-op. Snipe is very effective at single target damage, the ability to knock out an annoying air unit, two-shot a battlecruiser with mastery, or just kill a high-value target like a disruptor that is about to eviscerate your army. Sabotage Drone has its value in whittling away the enemy's base during downtime, as well as giving you vision for your nuke or an airstrike. And the nuke is a nuke. Assault Mode is where Nova really gets good. Gaining access to her shotgun, she gets a heavy splash ability known as Penetrating Blast, a blink ability which not only gives her a heavy micro tool, but also a temporary shield that she can replenish by immediately using blink again, which in turn makes Nova a very effective tank and a great unit to lead your armies with to absorb damage, as well as the nuke equivalent Hollow Decoy, aka Nova's Shade. The role of Nova's Shade is less obvious than the nuke, but it's an almost unkillable enemy that jumps in, grabs the attention of the entire army it's fighting, and in so doing allows you and your ally to jump in and sweep the enemy with less opposition. Another thing to note is Nova herself has a rate of life regeneration and access to detection, which is standard for excellent hero units from this point on. At higher level of play, what's important is knowing what mode to be in at any time. Generally because of how effective the shotgun is, especially with mastery, leading with it is the default way you want to engage in battles. This is not absolute. 
In downtime, it's better to be the sniper, as sabotage drones can chip away at the enemy with no possibility of loss. There are enemy compositions in specific battles where being in sniper mode is more advantageous, as shotgun can't hit air and units like disruptors really need to be killed immediately. Switching between the modes isn't always available. There is a relatively short cooldown before you're allowed to switch back. As a result, forward planning is very important to Nova's game plan. Nova also has a few top bar abilities. Unlike any other commander in the game, all are based on expending minerals to activate them. The cheapest one is the defense drone. A drone that when summoned will provide a defensive shield to any allied unit in the range that takes damage. This is easily Nova's best way to protect your army and is a huge plus to durability. Use them always. Griffin Airstrike is one of Nova's screen nukes, a relatively large area that takes a massive amount of damage, but at a steep resource cost. Useful for murdering scary attack waves and scary bases, though due to its steep cost you won't be able to use them that often. Tactical Airlift is a teleporter. Pick up a bunch of units and teleport them to anywhere you have vision. Very useful for map control and occasionally micro-strategy. The final ability is Nova Resurrection. If Nova is ever dead, you can pay an amount of minerals relative to the amount of time she has left to respawn. Doing so will spawn her immediately where you choose. These abilities are all a useful option for dumping minerals and provide plenty of utility to Nova's playstyle. Nova's masteries are game-changing, some of the most significant improvements for any commander in the game. The first power set is a choice between more nukes and cheaper airstrikes. The airstrikes are generally preferred as the reduced cost goes a long way in allowing you to use more of them over the course of a game. Nova primary ability up is huge as it makes her not only more powerful with snipe and shotgun, but sturdier with blink. She can two-shot units like Marauders with shotgun where she couldn't before. She could two-shot battlecruisers with snipe where she couldn't before. Just a very significant increase in power. The other significant increase in power is unit life regeneration. Prior to mastery, Nova's units rely on ravens for healing. With unit life mastery, they generate life back outside of combat free of charge. While maxing out the option isn't necessary, just having any at all is a huge buff to your army, as it makes ravens a nice tech option rather than an outright necessity. More energy regen is also big for Nova, as spamming her abilities is what makes her good. Nova's prestiges are all pretty good. P1 is specialization into a particular type of unit. You choose your building and the charges queue up faster. It has its fans and is generally the most common prestige I see for her from other players. P2 is my personal favorite prestige, being specialization into airlift, reducing its cooldown in exchange for an increased cooldown on airstrike. My philosophy on the subject is that airstrike is so expensive that spacing it out every two minutes shouldn't be significant. Meanwhile, you gain access to strong map control and an interesting micro option as a result. P3 is specialization into snipe. You lose shotgun, which sucks, but you gain super cloak and buffed sabotage drones. The way this plays out is you walk into the enemy base and destroy it without any resistance. Due to the loss of shotgun, it's a very peculiar prestige, but it's almost unrivaled for its offensive capacity on some stages. Dukov is the fourth Zerg commander. He is not Terran, he is Zerg. The soundtrack is a liar. Stukov attended the Zagara school of how to fight and chose to primarily base his army around massive amounts of disposable units. Only this time they are guaranteed to die via a timer. So that's progress, I guess. The first gimmick here is his access to an infested colonist compound. Upgradable throughout the game, it automatically generates infested Terrans that survive on a timer and head into the general direction of a rally point assigned to them by top bar. To supplement this steady onslaught, he has access to infested marines from two sources. One, infested bunkers that automatically generate an infested marine every now and then and send it to the rally point. And two, and the thing you're actually going to be using, infested barracks where you can purchase a lot of infested marines. The general idea is to produce a lot of barracks so when the time comes you can spam out a giant army and use it to destroy the enemy through sheer numbers. The marines themselves are fairly priced, and if implementing this strategy, Stukov has one of the lowest gas requirements of any commander in the game. 
Also, you can just hold down the A key to queue up multiple units, which prevents you from breaking your keyboard by spamming that button repeatedly. This strategy is all well and good, but it's not the only thing that Stukov has going for him. The rest of his army is more conventional. Infested siege tanks are a good defensive option. Infested diamondbacks are easily his best unit and core to the mech build. The ability to attack on the move and shoot down air units goes a long way in the micro game. Most Stukov players you see these days, especially with the advent of P1, just mask these things. Infested Liberators and Infested Banshees also exist, but are rarely used in favor of Diamondbacks. Also, I have never seen a Stukov ever build a Brood Queen before, though it's probably an interesting tech choice. For abilities, Stukov generates full screen Zerg creep for free. The purpose of this creep is to allow your infested marines to move relatively fast and limits how far you can build or move your buildings depending on how far the creep is spread. This also combos well with other Zerg commanders, in particular Kerrigan who gives extra bonuses with her malignant creep ability. For calldowns, he has three major ones. Infest Structure is a worse photon overcharge. It produces a ton of broodlings from the target building. This does include the enemy, so make of that what you will. And it gives a little healing to the structure, so again, make of that what you will. It's alright for defensive plays and very niche offense, but generally doesn't go that far and serves best as a distraction or a way to handle the earliest of the early attack waves. The other two calldowns are more significant. Apocalypse brings out an almost unkillable beast that goes out and shreds ground forces. It can sorta deal with air, but that's not its primary purpose. Alexander summons a giant infested battlecruiser, fixed with constant spawning infested marines and tentacle arms for whatever tentacle arms are used for. Better against air than Apocalypse, its role is usually to push into enemy bases and is better paired off with your army. It is not the be-all enemy attack wave killer that the Apocalypse is. Stukov's masteries are pretty standard. Stronger basic infested Terran spawn versus more broodling spawn is up to preference, I guess. I don't know. Shorter cooldowns for your twin behemoths is also up to preference. Power set 3 is whether you plan to go marines or diamondbacks. His prestiges are also a good example of proper specialization. P1 is specialization into mech units and is easily the most common way you'll find Stukov's playing today. For the small price of losing your free infested Terrans, you gain access to the removal of tech requirements for all your mech buildings, specifically the factory. Your mech units cost substantially less, and your siege tanks are uniquely buffed, which is nice, I guess. P2 is bad, don't use it. P3 is specialization into bunkers. It removes the defensive structure part of the equation in favor of auto-generating more marines for you. A good P3 player will generate a never-ending army of infested marines via giant piles of bunkers in your base. However, this strategy requires heavy ramp-up time and is very lag-intensive. Phoenix is the fifth Protoss commander in the game. Designed as the Purifier representative, because Karax doesn't count, he surprisingly doesn't have any Purifier class units from the campaign, barring similar unit types. The general premise here is Ultron the Commander. There are six AI personalities ripped from Protoss history, Calderas the Zealot from the opening cutscene to Legacy, Talus the Adept from the prologue to Legacy, Calderon, a dragoon turned immortal from a StarCraft 64 exclusive map of all things? Warbringer, a reaver turned colossus ripped from StarCraft Enslavers? But in reality, it's from the Hero tab on the StarCraft 1 editor. Mojo the Scout from the same. And Kolarian, the carrier from the Purifier missions in Legacy. All these hero units, once purchased, overtake any available host unit that you have built of their respective type. The hero units are clearly more powerful than your standard army units, equipped with not only up stats, but extra abilities and upgrades. There are multiple commander abilities based on the relationship between an AI personality and available host shells related to them. 
Tactical data web buffs each commander if you have extra shells of their unit type while avenging protocol. Gives champions buffs when related shells are destroyed or a temporary speed buff when they transfer into a new shell. This all culminates in a general one-size-fits-all strategy. Buy everything. Continually buy every type of combat unit he has and make sure you keep at least a few of each to not only buff your champions, but provide a buffer against your champions dying. Two other units unrelated to champions do exist. Conservators are a very effective spellcaster if for nothing else but protective field, though they're a bit too gas heavy for my liking. And the Disruptor is another spellcaster and is also really bad so you shouldn't use it. Phoenix is one of the most macro heavy commanders in the game, reliant on fairly simple micro engagements, generally a move to win. He excels when you have a large number of varied units. To do this, Phoenix has an exceptionally good ability of operational efficiency. This removes all tech requirements for all of your buildings, removes the gas cost to all these buildings, and halves their mineral costs. Phoenix can easily produce all of the buildings that he will need early on and at the same time. Build your gateways, robotics facilities, and starports simultaneously then place all your tech buildings while they're warping in. The intended purpose for this ability is largely to allow for a carrier rush, and while Phoenix can still rush carriers faster than any other commander, in a post-P2 Carex world, he can't spam them better. As it sits now, it's a very good tool to establish your base and macro out your army quickly. Phoenix's top bar abilities also happen to be his hero unit. Phoenix can be deployed onto the battlefield in three different forms, the Praetor Armor, the Solarite Dragoon, and the Cybros Arbiter. When a particular form is deployed, it does not regenerate shield or energy. To resolve this effect, the form must be undeployed by switching to a different form or dying and waiting for a three minute cooldown to rebuild it. The general practice of Phoenix is to continually change forms, allowing the other forms to rebuild energy for future engagements. The Praetor army is the general tank, highly effective at doing damage against ground and absorbing damage. It is a good choice to lead your army into engagements. Solarite Dragoon is your damage dealer. The ability to temporarily unlock the cooldowns of his splash abilities creates one of the highest amounts of burst damage in this mode. Cybros Arbiter is your utility option. Stasis Field is alright in helping engagements. Cloaking Field is almost never useful due to the excessive amounts of detection. The real benefit of the Arbiter is his recall ability, which combined with deploying anywhere within vision, gives an excellent teleporting ability for your army. Also, Arbiter is a detector and hero-based detection is pretty good. Phoenix's masteries aren't too significant. More attack speed or better energy regeneration depends on preference. Same for life or attack speed. The most interesting thing here, since Phoenix doesn't have energy for cauldowns, is an increased starting supply, which lets you skip the first pylon in your build order and helps you get your economy off the ground. Phoenix's prestiges are some of the worst in the game. P1 is a very acquired style, buffing his Phoenix suits but making said suits effectively call downs instead of a lasting hero. It has its fans, but it's very acquired and tougher to use than not. P2 is an extremely acquired playstyle, which can be best described as super best friends. In my experience, it's just worse, don't do it. And P3, I've never seen anyone use. It's even bad conceptually. Dahaka is the fifth Zerg commander. Existing as the primal Zerg representative, he carries a similar trait that Phoenix has. That being that none of his primal Zerg designs come from the campaign. In heart, the primal zerg were distinct from the regular zerg. Certain units were closer than others contextualized in the lore, but you need only look at how cool the primal ultralisk was to understand that this was a distinct faction. Dahaka's units are all just bluish-green versions of their regular counterparts. They match the color motif of Dahaka and are definitely distinct. But they could have been even more, which is just a tiny bit disappointing. To distinguish the Primal Zerg from their hive-minded counterparts, 
Dehaka has a few distinctions from most other Zerg commanders. He has no creep nor any benefits from it. Because primals don't have a hive mind, apparently that means his starting supply at level 1 gets to be 200. He also produces combat units from a separate building from the main hive. The center of Dahaka's game plan is his hero unit, Dahaka. Dahaka has the fastest time to spawn of any hero unit in the game. There is also a good reason for this. In his best attempt to mimic Abathur, all enemy units drop essence when they die. This essence can be collected by Dahaka. Collect enough, and he levels up. And upon leveling up, he gains additional stats as well as a mutation point that he can allocate to any new ability or upgrading any already purchased one that allots it, with some abilities locked to a level requirement. Dahaka is self-promoted as highly customizable with the player choosing to unlock different abilities at different times related to what the map calls for. He has spawned so fast because early game Dahaka is almost a joke. Extremely weak, he requires an intense amount of micro to survive against even the smallest of enemies. The premise is to do what I think they want you to do with Abathur. Go out against the enemy and pick them off one by one. In so doing, build early levels and therefore become more prepared for the later waves. When it comes to abilities, Dahaka sort of has it all, and once fully leveled, becomes arguably the strongest unit in the game, an unironic kaiju. The only problem, and the reason I say Kerrigan is stronger, is his struggle to get there. Leap is his area of effect attack, good ground splash that helps a lot in the early game, and scales very well in the later game. Intimidating Roar is a nicher option, it slows the movement and attack speed of all nearby enemies, but the secret best part is it disables the opponent's energy-based abilities, so those scary hybrids that boom away our units are suddenly unable to do so. Devour is arguably his best ability, giving a free kill while also giving a buff to Dahaka, dependent on the type of the enemy killed. Energy-based units cause a little explosion, air units give him a fire beam, etc. While these effects are notable, the real best thing about Devour is it also heals Dahaka, which helps a lot in the early game. A later ability, Scorching Breath, is a very effective anti-ground splash move, as well as some other good utility options like a healing aura, detection, more armor, and the ability to normally attack the air. He also has access to Deep Tunnel, which is nice. For his army, the gimmick they decided to run with was all his base units have an Archon-style merge. By fighting for supremacy, you can make a smaller unit become a bigger unit. As a result, most of his base units are underwhelming as they are designed as a gateway to bigger and better things. The Zergling can become a Ravisaur, which is an incredibly underwhelming ranged unit, though they do only cost minerals, and because of their range tend to die less, but they also have lower DPS. So if for nothing else, they're a mineral dump. The Roach becomes the Igniter, which is a Zerg Firebat for some reason, and the Guardian for a little extra gas on top of the original two units. The Hydralisk, which I occasionally use normally because they're fine for their role, can become the Mutalisk, which is arguably Dahaka's best unit, as it's a great all-around damage dealer with access to crap like reviving on death. Hydralisks can also make the Impaler, which is good for sieging and defense, I guess, I don't know. Primal hosts have their fans the same way that they have them with Abathur, though the Creeper host isn't quite a worthwhile upgrade, and you don't usually see people morph them if they're playing the Locust game anyways. Primal Ultralisks are never used outright, if they are used at all, they are used to morph out a Tyrannosaur, which is a beast of a unit. Very bulky, powerful, and undercut by how expensive they are. All the upgrades to these units can be found in three respective tech buildings. Upon the construction of these buildings, you gain access to Dahaka's calldowns, the primal pack leaders. First you get a flamey boy, then a gooey boy, and then a spiky boy. Ripped straight out of that mission from heart, these pack leaders are extremely powerful and some of the more formidable calldowns in the game. He also has access to spawn temporary detector turrets, 
which help here and there but aren't that significant if we're being real. There is also this gene mutation thing, but it's irrelevant. For mastery, they help more than not but aren't that significant. A buff to devour healing helps the early game, pack leaders sticking around for longer or more worms is up to preference, and go all in on attack speed because gene mutation chance is comically worthless. For prestiges, they all have their fans. P1 is basically specialization into boom. By devouring an energy-based enemy, you cause an explosion of damage. Making all nearby allied units to do this as well generally results in a frozen screen of lag, followed by the enemy being dead. P2 makes pack leaders even more powerful at the cost of only being available one at a time. It has its fans, but it's not for me. P3 is the meme pick. Technically being a straight plus, it gives you a second to Haka named Zwaihaka. The issue with this prestige is it gives Dahaka some Abathur problems that he was able to avoid by having his essence go to only one unit, and that unit being capable from the beginning. You will need to split your essence between the two Dahakas, and the amount of essence you get on a map will most likely not result in you reaching max level for both. Add on to that the extra amount of micro required to pull it off efficiently, and if you split it between both Dahakas evenly, they will be weaker at any given time than if there was just only one. It really drags down the commander in a way and is a questionable pick. He does look sick though, and that description is top tier. Han and Horner is the fourth Terran commander in the game. Based largely on that one mission from Heart, more so than Han's appearance in Wings, this commander is an amalgamation of disparate playstyles that questionably coalesce. Han and Horner is broken into Han's mercenaries and Horner's air fleet. To start with the more consequential side, Han has access to a lot of cheap, frail units that have death-based effects. These units are produced from her galleons, a controllable production structure built on the battlefield and limited to five normally. These buildings by themselves can attack, but they don't do that much damage. Their purpose is to allow you to continually build forces during engagements to immediately reinforce your army, very Raynor-like. They also outrange static, so they're good at poking at bases. For her units, the Reaper is the best thing she has. An extremely frail unit, it has the best generic damage of all Han's units, especially against structures. Their ability to fly on command is a gateway to tabbing your army to micro abilities. Reapers also regenerate life for some reason, so they're somehow simultaneously the least and most durable unit she has. Make of that what you will. Widow Mines exist, I'm sure you could use them, Hellions, which are alright, but no one ever uses them, and the Hellbat, which is less good, and no one ever uses them. All of these units have abilities that can activate on death, such as splash damage to fearing the enemy. For some other reason, all allied units generate a resource pickup when they die, refunding a portion of the cost of the unit. It's alright, I guess, but refunds have never been a good game mechanic. For her top bar abilities, she has a defensive option and a panic button. Magmines are very effective at both defense and offense, if you're big-brained enough to use it for that. Generally knowing where attack waves are going to be ahead of time lets you gimp them. The second ability is a screen nuke. You teleport a space station into your enemies, and then it explodes. When well placed, these generally delete whole attack waves and are very good if you need to do quick damage. On the other side of the equation is Horner. Horner units are all high HP, expensive units a la Nova. They spawn immediately at their starport when purchased from a Nova-like Q and proceed to wreck the opponent. His units are the Wraith, which is his cheapest option and does fairly well against everything, though it's also fairly frail in comparison to its counterparts. The Viking, which is an effective anti-air option, 
but Wraiths and Battlecruisers combined tend to fill its role better. Ravens, which are his only detector and tend to be pretty good support with their Alarak style increased damage ability. The Battlecruiser, which is the beefiest unit he has, high HP makes it good for tanking, but the overcharged reactors upgrade makes its attack a mini Yumano cannon and as such incredibly powerful. Tactical jump for all these units can be purchased, allowing for instant full screen map teleporting, which is good for map control. It leaves your Reapers and Galleons behind, so it could be better. Another thing to note is Horner units have an automatic self-heal, something that the Galleons can even get if you buy them drone hangers. This auto-heal is very significant in keeping your army alive. Matched with Reapers, almost all combat units you have will be self-sustaining. When it comes to abilities, I'm a bit more mixed on Horner's top bar. Precision strikes exist, you buy bomber platforms, then you gain a bomber. They're used to strike the enemies in the fog of war in a high value on specific maps, but they're a lot harder to use than not, and you have to invest in them to get them, so it's questionable. Colin the Fleet is his panic button, and it's probably the strongest top bar here. Serving as Horner's screen nuke, it absolutely wrecks any area of units, making any individual attack wave or base effectively free. It's very strong. Other interesting tech exists for this commander. Supply depots give increased supply, which makes your macro easier. And significant others gives the two types of units a power buff dependent on the supply of the other. It helps, but it's not that significant. When it comes to masteries, Han and Horner doesn't really benefit that much. Strike fighter area of effect is what you invest in even if you don't have strike fighters because Stronger Death Chance apparently doesn't do anything with prestiges. Significant other bonuses get used because Salvage is bad, Mag Mines are good, but putting too many points there just makes it excessive. Their prestiges are a bit more significant. P1 is specialization into Han, focusing on more death effects and Mag Mines at the cost of more expensive corner units. P2 is specialization into Horner, making his units cheaper and the charges faster all up Nova P1. This prestige is the most common one you'll find. P3 is specialization into bomber platforms for some reason. It removes the cap of 10 but doubles their cost. This prestige has an Abathur P3 issue, making the cost double removes your ability to get them out and maintain your early game. If you really want bombers, you'll tend to do better with all the other options. Besides that issue, it's an interesting mutation pick. Tychus is the fifth Terran commander, primarily based off the gameplay of Belly of the Beast from Wings. Tychus is the ultimate hero commander. Tychus has no regular army. Instead, he has extremely powerful hero units known as outlaws. Each outlaw has one castable ability along with a couple passive abilities and generally high stats. You can only have a max of five outlaws out at any given time. The ability to recruit them is based on a timed queue like Nova and Horner before him. The order you recruit them dictates the respective abilities hotkey and location on your hub. All outlaw abilities are selectable at the same time in your army, removing the need to manually switch units making the micro much easier than it would be otherwise. If killed, the units can be respawned in your main base for a small resource cost. Tychus excels at fighting armies. By having a small force he excels at burst damage, covering a lot of ground but falling off with actual damage. What this means in practice is when forced into a scenario where he needs to kill higher HP targets like objectives or buildings, he tends to fall off more so than other commanders. His army is split into three groups, the guns, the muscles, and the fixers. Each of these groups have a respective building for teching purposes. The first of these units is Tychus. Free at the beginning and spawning faster than most hero units in this mode, he is bulky with decent damage. His ability Shredder Grenade is a good area of effect spell and his top bar cooldown Odin, a high HP walker that is a glorified nuke upgrade which somehow has less DPS than Tychus himself. 
Not only does the Odin make him go away when called, but it revives Tychus for free if it comes to that. Giving Shredder grenades a pull effect is an interesting tech option, otherwise his upgrades are general pluses to his performance but not top priorities. The Reaper Crooked Sam is your heavy single target damage hero. Probably the most frail of the available heroes. His ability to plant a charge that deals massive single target damage has some interesting properties, like stunning the unit via upgrade. He excels in missions like Oblivion Express or Dead of Night where you need to kill high HP objectives or structures. All of his upgrades buff his charges except for cloaking and taking damage. Don't ask me why he has that. The Warhound James Sirius Sykes is one of the better units here. Secretly a good anti-air unit because of his anti-air upgrades. His ability spawn turrets are a very good micro option to tank and generally just a very powerful option. His abilities go further than others due to all upgrades applying to his turrets alongside him. In particular, his fear ability is very good against pretty much everything. Another thing to note is his turrets have detection, so if for whatever reason you don't have that, there is an alternative. Moving on to the muscle, the Firebat Miles Blaze Lewis exists. His ability Oil Spill poops the enemy, making them slower and catching them on fire if attacked by a fire-based attack. Blaze excels on infested maps as fire spreads between units and with their clumping helps deal a lot of damage fast. This playstyle is strong but niche, using a melee unit is very questionable and his ability isn't immediately helpful in most situations. Removed from infested maps, he isn't that good. His abilities are standard to what you'd expect. Wild Flame Fuel additives is the most important one and the rest aren't too good. The Herc, Rob Cannonball, also exists. Serving as a melee tank, he has access to the most bulk of all of his units, some stun, a self-revive apparently, and a grapple stun ability to allow him to get in front of the engagement and tank for you. His abilities are all fine in helping perform the role of frontline tank well. This is also a unit you rarely see with Tychus. He generally just doesn't do that much when you could have had another unit in his place. His role doesn't have a particular niche like the Firebat, so ultimately he's not that important, though I personally like him more than the Firebat. The Marauder Kev Rattlesnake West is the general go-to healer for Tychus. His ability Deploy Revitalizer gives an area of effect heal for all allied units and sometimes buffs if you bought that. The reason he's the go-to healer for Tychus is that he can heal and attack. His damage is decent and the healing is sufficient in most situations. As a result, he goes a lot further than the other healing option for the majority of scenarios. His upgrade to increase healing rate of the Revitalizers and I guess the increased attack speed are good. The rest aren't too important. Now, moving on to fixers, it is worth noting that through the engineering bay upgrades, these will be your detectors. Vega is a super cool design for a ghost. She is also a nice tech option. Her ability Dominate is a very good mind control ability and has great value on particular enemy builds. Most of her upgrades buff this mind control. The secret cool tech that she has that makes her an anti-air is her Psy Projector, which lets her effectively stun any five enemy air units at any time. This helps out a ton against air builds and makes her secretly a good anti-air option. The Spectre Nux is a well-liked unit for his ability Ultrasonic Pulse, which is basically Psy Storm. All of the upgrades he has are essential to make this unit work, more so than others as they dramatically buff his Psy Storm via length, damage, and size. His final upgrade also reduces the cooldown for other outlaws, which is very good and something nice to focus on getting. The Medic Lieutenant Lena Nikara is the healing specialist. With access to more healing options, she is very effective at keeping your army alive. The problem is she has no way to attack. Her ability causes a local area of effect heal and all of her upgrades buff either her passive healing or her burst ability in some way. 
generally, the Marauder is preferred as his healing is sufficient while also providing damage to your army, though the medic has niche uses in certain mutations. Moving past his units, there's not much else. He can build medifact platforms for full screen teleports that cloak and heal. You'll occasionally see Tychus players who don't build a Marauder or Medic and just use these for healing to good effect. Odin Calldown was mentioned earlier, Engineering Bay has some unit type specific upgrades there, and general attack and defense upgrades go up to 5 instead of 3. Tychus has alright masteries. Increased cooldown for Shredder Grenades if you're on point enough to use them, or increased attack speed if you're lazy like me. Improved engineering bay upgrades or faster availability of your units is undercut by the fact you generally don't need your units early, and faster cooldowns comes to preference. His prestiges are fairly strong. P1 gives him faster cooldowns on his units in exchange for a higher cost and increased queue time for his units. It basically makes his army better at the cost of taking longer to get out. P2 is the fan favorite and arguably the strongest option he has. Going against common sense, it specializes in your units being separated and getting massive buffs as a result. You can pull off some crazy stuff with how powerful your units get and cover many disparate areas at once, but it's an acquired style and very micro-intensive. It's also worth noting that since you need your army separated, it removes detection and healing from many a unit you will have. P3 makes the Odin a more permanent fixture of your army in exchange for losing your nuke. Something interesting to note is that this prestige takes away your ability to revive Tychus with the Odin, as he is no longer in the Odin. Zeratul is the 6th Protoss commander. Zeratul is the closest thing in all of co-op to easy mode. You see, when playing StarCraft, there are a lot of variables you need to keep track of. Prioritizing when you make probes, army units, upgrades, when you build your refineries, and when you cap them off. These are the fundamental aspects of macro play, and it is a defined skill you learn in this game. In co-op, the macro play varies from Commander. On the lower end, there is Nova where her refineries are automatic, her units come out immediately, but investing in research has an opportunity cost of less units earlier and as such you're still making decisions. On the higher end you have Phoenix, where constructing your army and getting your upgrades is the biggest part of what you're doing. Zeratul is an interesting commander in that he has no macro game. Zeratul is primarily based around this artifact mechanic. Once your hero unit Zeratul pops out, he will look for an artifact. You will get a vision of where the artifact is, with the blackness of fog removed so you can scan the map and then go there, use the ability, and collect the artifact. Upon collecting the artifact, your tech goes up. Basic attack and defense goes up one level along with various upgrades for all of your units. Upon the start of the map, your geysers are automatically capped with automatic assimilators. The need to construct them yourself is gone. How this all plays out is simple. There are no upgrades to purchase. There is no cost to building assimilators. The only thing you must spend your resources on are probes, buildings, and combat units. These combat units are beasts, powerful enough to justify a max army cap of 100. As far as complexity is concerned, almost all abilities can be set to autocast. The lone exception being his Dark Templar equivalent, the Void Templar's blink ability, and his Nidus Network equivalent teleporter that only really good players use. In regard to his actual production, a commander ability halves the time to construct. There are only two unit production facilities and roughly three extra buildings for teching purposes with nothing else to get from them. His Stalker is decent and cheap, his Sentry has shielding, which makes the army very sturdy and a must-have. Dark Templar are good, I guess, but only deal ground damage, so whatever. His Immortal is great against air and generally a heavy hitter, but is a bit on the expensive side. His Disruptors are a good splash option, but is heavy gas cost and shouldn't be masked. And the Observer has no supply cost and is a fairly good detector. He also has access to Photon Cannons that create a shade anywhere in Vision. 
This is a viable offensive strategy, though you won't see it too often. Zeratul himself is a bit of a bog standard hero unit. He has a melee splash ability, blink, and a full screen teleport to make getting artifacts easier. The other big stuff he has is his top bar abilities. Without any fragments, he can choose a legion from three options. Telbrus Legion, which is a good splash ground option, especially useful against Zerg. Zorea Legion, which is a good damage option and the best option of the three to opening your expansion early. And Serdeth Legion, which is an effective way to bursting enemy attack waves but falls off in outright damage. After finding the first fragment, you get three options for another cooldown. Stasis Beam, which is bad and no one likes it. Tesseract Monolith, which is a good stun static and especially good to the Photon Cannon Shade strategy that you occasionally see. And the Void Suppression Crystal, which neuters any base or attack wave they come across with its reduced attack speed and disabling of enemy structures. Upon getting the second artifact, you can choose between increasing the amount of time your cooldowns units last, decreasing the cooldown for cannon shades, and reducing blink cooldown, which micro gods probably like. The third artifact gets you an avatar. The avatar of form, which you never see because it's worse than the avatar of essence, which not only gives a huge buff to your army, but also devolves the enemy units in hilarious fashion. In regards to masteries, there are significant effects to be found here. Increased attack speed for either Zeratul or your regular army is up to preference. Being able to find your artifacts faster means you can power up Zeratul faster, but the cooldown reduction helps once you've maxed artifacts. Reduced resource cost on your Legion. All a Nova Mastery is helpful, though Avatar cooldown is nice too, I guess. Zeratul's prestiges are all busted. P1 is somehow the least busted among these. The creation of a super cloak field in exchange for losing your full screen teleport makes finding later game artifacts a bit more of a pain. In exchange for an instant win button to any and all encounters, provided you are properly prepared for them, as the enemy can't fight back. P2 removes the cap of three artifacts so that you can continually raise your tech level with the cost of more expensive units. With a maximum investment in faster artifacts, I've been able to reach nine. It's a meme pick and generally more of a pain than a benefit. P3 is just broken. It cuts the maximum artifacts down to two, reducing the maximum amount of power your army can have and removing avatars in their entirety but gives Zeratul a powerful whirlwind ability and his buffed shadow cleaves, making Zeratul one of the more broken hero units in the game. Stepman is the sixth Zerg commander. Unlike many other commanders, his origin of existence can be pinpointed to a specific thing. They made a cool Zerg robot skin for regular multiplayer mode. Due to the positive reception those skins had, as well as the desire to get more out of those assets in a similar manner to the creation of Majora's Mask, these skins were incorporated into a new commander. The problem was that there was no character in StarCraft that made immediate sense to have a Mecha Zerg army. The closest that they could come to to justify was Stetman. Stetman as a character in the campaigns is very bare bones. He exists as a background element in Wings, not even being a mainline dialogue option and doesn't appear in any of the other campaigns. To define his playstyle, they pulled his appearance and personality exclusively from what they changed him into in one co-op map. Missed opportunities. The single most important thing in Stepman's toolbox is his Stetalites. Supposed to be a mix between Pylon Power and Creep, Stetalites are a top bar that you deploy in an active Stetalite zone, a Stet zone. They can be attacked by the opponent, but once successfully deployed, will auto-revive if killed. The benefits of these Stet zones are whatever you want it to be at any given time. Three options from your top bar can be selected. Increase all allied units' speed, provide healing, and provide energy regeneration. The general game plan is simple. Get these Stetalites everywhere, from which you not only give yourself passive buffs, along with map vision, but your ally as well. In this manner, Stepman is the closest thing in the game to a support commander, as this and his hero unit 
are his main strengths given no other top bar abilities. Speaking of his hero unit, Gary is a drone ripped from missed opportunities and repurposed into a fighter. Being the only base commander hero unit in the game that flies, he is sort of alright. While his health is fairly bulky and his damage is decent with the ability to attack on the move, the real benefits come from his abilities. E-Gorb is his area of effect spell. He shoots an energy ball that does Psy Storm-like damage per second to all enemies. This is a particularly good burst damage option and great for clearing clumps of units. It also shoots three balls instead of one if in a stet zone, so the idea is never venture too far from them. Stedolite Overcharge is secretly the best ability he has. By overcharging a nearby Stedolite, he creates multiple temporary buffs to be cast continually on nearby allied units. The most significant is the Nova-like Shield. When on healing, Overcharge creates a temporary shield that will absorb a healthy amount of damage for a bit of time. When on speed, it will give units increased attack speed in a similar manner, and on energy it causes increased energy regen for the respective units. Gary also has a teleport to any active Stenolite and bring your army with you button, which is great for map control. The best thing about Gary, though, is that this isn't even his final form. By buying Super Gary, you gain access to not only better stats, but more importantly, cues on your abilities, allowing you to use them more often, and a new fourth ability, which lets Super Gary create a step zone around him temporarily which helps with pushing out into new areas. Super Gary is also a detector, which is always nice to have on your hero units. Stepman's army, while he exists primarily because of the Mecha Zerg skins, are fairly standard and underwhelming in the higher power level of co-op. First thing to note is that all of his units have energy. This is because all his units have some energy-based ability that can be researched and then used, but have no energy regen on their own. To supplement this, you have to use your energy stat zones to recoup spent energy. The first of these units is the Mecha Zergling, probably the best Zergling outside of specific strategies like Zagara. It is an extremely effective tank unit with a combination of the stat zone healing and damage reduction ability of hardened Egonary Shield. Add on that, it only costs minerals and is an incredibly effective mineral dump. Moving on to the Mecha Bane thing, it exists, but I have yet to see it once. The Mecha Hydralisk is one of the core units of his army, specializing in anti-air for both range and damage with its abilities, with the one major flaw that said ability takes up a lot of energy. Using this unit requires that you keep an eye on how much energy your units have and let them restore in off time. They are also fairly frail and benefit greatly from other bulkier units supplementing them. Mecha Lurker also exists, but due to its ability being manual cast for some reason, as well as the more niche value of defense, the Lurker tends to be lacking outside of specific maps. The Mecha Corruptor is good against air probably, I've never seen anyone use it. The Mecha Battle Carrier Lord is an extremely expensive, weird amalgamation of all the capital ships of all the races, that just isn't worth it in my experience. The Mecha Infester is an extremely powerful unit to specialize in. They create a disposable army for you that you can steamroll the opponent with. This strategy was easily the best he had day one. It was also nerfed since then. Extremely micro and energy dependent, the Mecha Infester strategy now is a bit too taxing and not most people's preferred strategy. Mecha Ultralisks are an extremely bulky option that can be slotted to tank for more frail units like the Hydralisk. Another feature of his army is the strange commander ability of Friends Forever. When an army unit dies, remnants are picked up by a nearby Stedolite or Gary. Once enough are collected, the respective tech building for that unit will poop out a new one. This is noticeable with spammed Zerglings, but is mostly a non-factor. The general game plan is to keep your army alive with healing and smart micro plays, so recycled units should be a nice bonus, but not the premeditated strategy. Stepman's masteries are significant. Costs to research down is generally always good, but overshadowed by just how strong ability cooldown for Gary is. 
better bonuses on stat zones help out, and deploy satellites cooldown helps out getting more of them, while structure morph rate helps get your base up faster. For his prestiges, P1 is specialization into stet zones, removing the ability for satellites to be killed and increasing the zone but losing Super Gary. For mutators where having map vision benefits you, this is a must-have tech option. But for general play, the loss of Super Gary is fairly big, so use with caution. P2 is easily the most commonly used. It doubles Gary's health and damage, but dramatically reduces his speed outside of stet zones. The ability to get stet zones out on some faster maps is questionable, but the speed reduction is so significant that it might as well mean he can't leave these zones at all. This is however supplemented by the fact that you should be playing within your stat zones at all times anyways, if it can be helped, and the power boost that Super Gary gets makes him an absolute monster. P3 exists. I have never seen one in the wild though, so it may be a lie. Arcturus Mansk is the 6th Terran commander and the final commander added to the game. He is also a problem. When co-op missions was first added, it was a selection of maps with objectives on them. As the mode evolved, they added complexity. Every map now has a dedicated announcer. They contextualize why you're there and what you're doing. The general setting of the mode is the end war of Legacy, but to be more specific, it takes place after leaving Ire for the first time and before the beginning of the epilogue a la Lock and Load. Every mission has you doing something that is contextualized as directly opposing the big bad or supporting some good guy faction in the war. The only exception to this is Malwarfare, which is helping someone against their own stupidity, but even that is helping an allied force. By the end of Co-op's lifespan, they took the idea of non-canon a bit further than they did earlier on. Tychus and Zeratul are both dead. Spoilers, by the way. During the time frame of the mode to the point that their advertising materials describe them as what-if scenarios. Manx fits this role too, but breaks the setting a bit further than they did before. Manx is, in the story, a villain. In this mode, he is a villain. A lot of his design is based around how much of an uncaring ruler he is, all the way to it being included in his design notes. Up until this point, all commanders could be considered as parties to the good guy faction. Putting these specifics aside, all these commanders are part of the protagonist faction of the three campaigns. Mansk is not. The idea that Kerrigan would ever voluntarily work with Mansk, considering how Hart plays out, is incredibly dubious. You can never suffer enough for all the lives you've ruined, Arcturus. This issue really doesn't exist for any other commanders, barring maybe Vorazun and Zeratul. Zeratul killed my mother, Artanis. I will always hate him for this. I will always hold him in the highest contempt. Rajagal was corrupted by the Queen of Blades, Matriarch. Yes, I know that now. Reason has no bearing on emotion. Our kind embraces this more than yours. Furthermore, Arcturus being the Emperor of the Dominion is conflicted by the setting in that multiple maps outright reference the Emperor to be Valerian. Even in the context of what if he survived, the story of certain maps are in direct opposition to this commander. We could have had my boy Valerian. It didn't need to be like this. As a commander himself, Mansk is a weird amalgamation of completely disparate strategies, most of which can be better specialized on other commanders. Starting with his basic infantry, Mansk doesn't have SCVs. Instead, he has laborers, who, with a nearby command center or supply depot doubling as a bunker, can trade in their mining tools for a basic gun and become a Dominion trooper. Once you have a Dominion Trooper, you can upgrade them with guns. The Assault Trooper is a generally good all-around unit that technically has the double output of a regular Trooper, 
The Flame Trooper is a melee splash option that also has more HP and armor than his contemporaries. And the Rocket Trooper is the anti-air option. If any trooper with a purchased gun dies, they drop the gun on the ground, at which point any non-upgraded trooper can just come and pick it up. Supplementing this is the engineering bay upgrade that allows your trooper to spawn in on the rally point Olive Rainer, creating a continual spam of weaker units while any investment into more damage can be recovered. The biggest issue with this strategy is the Rainer-like issue of abysmally weak units. Regular troopers have incredibly low life, and the HP buff to flame troopers is nice, but not too significant, and those units fall off when not fighting light units like Zerg. Furthermore, any and all splash damage will utterly wreck these units in mass, and while healing does exist in the way of medevacs, it doesn't do much to change how this is arguably one of the most frail armies in this mode. Of course, this isn't the only type of unit he has. Straight from his regular production buildings, you have his Royal Guard. High cost, high value units that are more durable, pack a bigger punch, and also level up when near combat. To start out with, the Aegis Guard, or Marauder, is a good tanking option and does great against armored ground. He is also the cheapest of the Elite Guard and therefore the easiest to spam. The Emperor's Shadow, his ghost, who I always thought was supposed to be a reference to Mary Jade before realizing that her name was Shadow and not Hand, has a couple interesting abilities and most can be set to autocast as is the only elite guard that can attack air while also being healed by your medevacs. But the really interesting ability of Tactical Missile Strike kinda just sucks so it really isn't worth it to me. Also, side note, this unit is based on Manx concept art and is in my opinion the lamest ghost design in the entire game. For an elite ghost, she looks impressively cheap and way less cool than Vega. Other side note, Pyrokinesis is a rare ghost ability in StarCraft lore. So for all we know, this is secretly Tanya Caulfield from StarCraft Evolution, of all things. Make of that what you will. Moving on. The Shock Division, or Siege Tank, is a very good defensive option and does great on more defensive stages. Paired up with top bar bunkers, you can make a very good static line, but as we've addressed before, statics in this mode are bad. Also, you can put them in medevacs and they'll attack air, but like, why are you doing this? Stop being so weird. The Black Hammer, or Thor, is one of the bigger, scary units in his arsenal. An excellent tank unit with pretty good anti-ground damage, also has an anti-air ability if you feel like using it, I don't know. The Sky Fury or Viking is a bit too expensive for its role, just use other stuff. The Imperial Intercessor or Medivac is your healer and essential for keeping not only your troopers alive, but your bio guard as well. The rest of your royal guard require that they be repaired by laborers. The Pride of Augustgrad is the biggest, scariest unit he has. While the most expensive and the longest to level up, it does good damage and has good health. Only low point being his Yamato Cannon can't be autocast, so it's a bit more micro-intensive to use effectively. The last and most important unit is the Imperial Witness. The Imperial Witness provides a buff of attack and movement speed upon being put into its Patriot mode and serves as a detector. While it's a decent support option and is outright necessary for its detection, its greatest benefit is the generation of Imperial Mandate. You see, Manx requires energy for his cooldowns. It's been a shocking amount of commanders since that's been required. The generation of this energy normally is abysmal, so he implements two methods to increase this. The first and easiest way is indoctrinating units. By putting an Imperial Witness into Patriot mode, any units you have, only yours by the way, your ally can't help, will generate energy for your cooldowns. An upgrade in the Fusion Core, Amplified Airwaves, doubles the amount of energy this generates, and as such, teching immediately to the Fusion Core is the first thing that any Manx player should be striving for, as the buffs from cooldowns is that significant. Get one Imperial Witness for each base you have so your miners generate energy for you. 
Leave another for your army to detect, and you're good to go barring them dying somehow. The second way to get your Imperial Mandate up is building Royal Guard. The more supply of Royal Guard you have, the faster the energy generates. This becomes a bigger source of energy by the end game, assuming you're playing Royal Guard as your build, but the time to get there is so significant that indoctrination is still the main source and number one thing to get on your game plan. Now when it comes to calldowns, he has four options to pick. The first and arguably most significant is forced conscription. This drops a bunker anywhere within vision with six troopers in them for the cost of 25 energy. These build up in a charged queue so you can use it repeatedly in a moment if need be, but not too many. This ability is huge as troopers can immediately be exchanged for laborers. Due to the reduced cost of laborers to keep up with their spam unit strategy, the advanced construction skill ripped straight from Swan, and the ability to quickly build six extra workers from a call down gives Minx one of the fastest economies and bases to set up in the game. Dogs of War is an effective panic button, getting stronger with each multiple of 25 energy expended into it. You summon an efficient army of Zerg to deal and absorb damage. Nuclear Annihilation is a powerful screen nuke option. Costing a full 100 energy, you can deal huge damage to enemy bases or attack waves if planned out correctly. The last of these four is Contaminated Strike, which causes fear and passive damage to an area and is directly related to your Earth Splitter Ordinance. Now, up to this point, you can see that Minx has a lot of tools for weird roles. The problem I have is if you want to go a cheap but immediately replaceable army, you could have gone Raynor. If you want to go expansive and high impact units, you could have gone Nova. His cooldowns are good and you can spam them with how much energy you generate, but they're fairly standard. The one thing that is uniquely his is his Earth Splitter Ordinance. By building this gun and then stocking them with workers, you can continually bombard any area within range, upgraded through Engineering Bay. This building is unique in that it lets you whittle down attack waves before engaging them or just pound enemy bases and objectives from a nice, safe distance. The closest analog for this being Horner's Bomber Platforms. A couple drawbacks is they don't hit air, shoot in a general area, and lack precision and some maps aren't conducive for this playstyle, but some are. This is generally viewed as the strongest thing this commander has, and with the fact it gives you vision of the area it's striking works well with casting top bar abilities, making him a very effective top bar spam commander. This strategy is also incredibly niche and not immediately obvious, like construct a large army, making him one of the toughest commanders in the game to really get good with. His masteries go a bit further than most commanders. Power set 1, while Royal Guard Imperial support may outpace Laborer and Trooper support by the end game. Just go all in on Laborer. Indoctrination is just that important. Power set 2 depends on if you're using Royal Guard or Call Downs more, so a build choice. For power set 3, 25 starting Imperial Mandate is a bare minimum as that gives you an immediate bunker for extra workers. His prestiges are a good example of prestige specialization. P1 specializes in bombardment, P2 specializes in royal guard, and P3 specializes in making your troopers quasi banelings for some reason. The most common I see is P1, I like P2 the most, and P3 has its fans, but it's a very acquired style. Co-op missions are far closer related to the campaign than regular multiplayer. Nowhere is that closer realized than the map design. Barring two special cases, all maps in this mode are designed off a previous map from one of the campaigns. In the StarCraft wiki, these maps are divided into three groups dependent on what the emphasis of the objective is. Assault, which emphasizes assaulting multiple fortified enemy positions. Control, which emphasizes teamwork, multitasking, map control, and escorting. And finally, Siege, which emphasizes defending fixed points from the enemy. For the purposes of analysis, I will address these maps in the order they were released. 
To start with, when the mode was first added to the game, we got the first five maps. Oblivion Express is a siege type map. Amon's forces are transporting materials over Tarsonis via train. Your job is to intercept and destroy said trains. Graven Hill is the announcer. Another contract fulfilled. Got my thanks, commanders, but uh, not my cut. <laughs> These trains have preordained paths, broadcasted to the player once sent and where they are. They also have high HP and continually increase in value throughout the map. The general idea is simple. Control the two main paths that the trains will take and manage to not only kill the objectives, but also the enemies that will be sent to escort them. The bonus objective on this map are spare trains, existing on a bottom track that no other trains will be sent on. This will occur twice and neither gets escort armies. These trains exist to split up your army as they spawn at times that are disadvantageous to move all your forces towards it. Both these trains have significantly less life than the main objective trains. You can only fail to kill one train before you fail the mission. A nice thing about this map is its predictability. All attack wave spawns are consistent and the first attack wave spawns after all hero units would. On the other side, the enemy base is particularly tough to kill and keep killed, and there's not a lot of easy spare units to kill to help out Abathur and Dahaka. Furthermore, the amount of health the train has requires a lot of DPS. As such, commanders with better splash options like Tychus fall off a bit. This map is heavily based on The Great Train Robbery from Wings. Rifts to Core Hall is an assault type map. Amon's forces are deploying void shards outside of Core Hall's palace, with the intention of using these to blow up Core Hall if given enough setup time. Your job is to destroy them in the allotted time. Corporal Faraday is the announcer. That's all of the Void Shards. The city is ours. You hear that, Amon? The Dominion is not so easily defeated. The gist of this mission is the continual pushing into fortified bases. Once the current wave of Shards is destroyed, a larger amount in a deeper base is added to replace them, culminating in 10 Shards before victory. The latter shards are placed behind larger bases which require stronger forces to kill. Occasionally pirates ripped straight out of, with friends like these from Heart, will appear and ransack the city. Killing these pirates are the bonus objective. The first pirate spawn is dependent on a fixed timer, the second spawns after killing six void shards. The second spawn is particularly far out of the way, requiring you to fight into a fortified base or get it by other means. In the entire map pool, this map sticks out for two things. The earliest first attack wave, which requires a lot of commanders to rush a defense for, and that there is only one spot where enemy waves can spawn from, and as such can be spawn camped out effectively more so than other maps. Other than that, this is a very standard map and can prove to be one of the faster maps in the game. This map can also be gimped by a fair number of commanders. Special mention goes to Minsk. This map is based on The Reckoning from Heart. Temple of the Past is a siege type map. Amon's forces want to destroy a Zelnaga temple on Shakuris. He will continually throw attack waves after it and the occasional Void Thrasher. You must protect the temple long enough for preparations to be finished and the temple activated. Whatever it is that's supposed to actually do. Rohana is the announcer. Preparations are complete. Our defenses have held and the temple stands ready. Victory is ours, commanders. This is probably the cleanest example of a defense stage in the game. There are four directions that they can come from, two sides clearly delineated in responsibility by the two commanders spawned by them. A main line in the front where the most waves will be spawned, and a back air side. Occasionally, enemies will be spawned in the base, and Void Thrasher is outside that will continually do damage to the temple and therefore need to be killed off. This map is my case study for why statics aren't as good as armies. 
You have clear choke points, but these can be subverted through not only in-base spawns, but the necessity to leave your base to knock off Void Thrashers. In that aspect, this map has it all for a defense setup. One of the other motivating factors to get you to leave your base is the bonus objective. Three Zenith Crystals existing outside your base are interfering with the preparations. These are present from the very beginning and stick around through the entire map, requiring you to invest some number of forces away from actively protecting a lane to kill them. This map has a fair number of random elements to it, Occasionally there will be an extra thrasher, and the attack waves have a general mold to their pattern, but aren't perfectly consistent, requiring you to maintain good map control. This map is heavily based on Last Stand from Legacy. As far as lore is concerned, I personally like to view this map as the co-op canon equivalent for Last Stand, being the exact point in the story, only a different setup. Void Launch is a control type map. On the planet Calder, Amon is attempting to transport his forces across the sector by using stolen Protoss shuttles and sending them through warp conduits. You must destroy enough of the shuttles to cripple his operations. Cartwright is the announcer. You've succeeded in thwarting Amon's plan. Our research facility and the sector owe you a great debt, commanders. The premise here is to destroy moving objectives like Oblivion Express, but it leans more heavily into map control. There are more directions that the shuttles can go, and general attack waves will be spawned away from the main objective requiring good multitasking. This is supplemented by the bonus objectives, which are research shuttles that move into the enemy area and must be protected for a given time, most notably against a singular attack wave which will be spawned and sent to destroy it. This encourages a forward presence, though this map is one of the most welcoming to the usage of statics in the game. One unique aspect is that this is the most air-intensive mission around. As the objectives are air units and escorted by competent support, there is no other map with as many air units that you are guaranteed to encounter. Even when the enemy composition isn't air, you tend to see more in their attack waves than you'd expect from any other map. The other thing to note is that the enemy base has two mineable bases with two geysers each, making this the most resource-rich level in the whole mode of co-op, should you push into the enemy base to begin with. This map is heavily based on Shoot the Messenger from Heart. Void Thrashing is an assault-type map. A Terran base located on Char, apparently, don't ask me how that got there, is under attack from Amon. He's spawning Void Thrashers to blast the base into submission, and you need to kill them before they destroy the fortress. Sergeant Alabama Kowalski is the announcer. Couldn't have done it better myself, Commanders! Woo! Do you ever have need of a tank, Jockey? I'm your gal. <laughs> These Void Thrashers spawn partially on a timer, partially on relation to when the Void Thrashers were killed, partially in relation to where your units are. If you take too long in killing one section, the other will spawn regardless, but killing a section off appears to speed up the process of the next match appearing. The Void Thrashers directly attack the fortress, unless engaged in direct combat. They spawn deep into fortified enemy bases, increasing in number each section with a total of 10 Void Thrashers over the whole map. In a lot of ways, this map is extremely similar to Rifts to Core Hall. The difference is subtle. This map could theoretically be dragged on for a very long time based on how the Void Thrashers work. While the life of the fortress serves as a quasi-timer before you lose, they don't take damage if the Void Thrashers haven't spawned yet, or you're engaging them in combat, making it so that this map can realistically be cleared with no damage to the fortress at all, given proper army spread and overall competency, though this isn't the easiest thing in the world to do. The bonus is an Archangel, ripped from back in the saddle from heart. The general idea they were going for is you deal so much damage and it runs away to the other side of the map, 
where it repairs itself requiring you to run all the way there or micromanage a second force to be there waiting. In practice, most of the time you just deal so much damage to it so fast that it doesn't get the chance to escape, resulting in a quick kill and one of the easier to handle bonus objectives in the game. Taking everything into consideration, this is one of the easiest and fastest maps in the mode. The objectives aren't too hard to put down, and there isn't that much land to cover. This map is based on old soldiers from Heart. Lock and Load is a control type map on Olnar. The combined forces of the Terran Zerg and Protoss want to do the prologue to the end of the game. Amon's forces have invaded Olnar and attempted to prevent you from opening a portal to the void by destabilizing the temple's locks, apparently. Your job is to activate all five locks so you can open the portal and finish the fight. The announcer is Rohana, who still has her nerve cords, even though they should be cut by this point in the game, but whatever. The locks are in place and Olnar's energies have been stabilized. We can now use the temple to enter the void and put an end to Amon. This map has a quasi-timer in that any locks that are captured by the enemy build up a charge that, once finished, will lose you the map. Certain aspects combat this, such as a single unit at a lock will prevent the enemy from being able to capture it. The timing for these locks being captured is also very loose and largely dependent on individual units just walking on when you're not looking or announced attack waves. Either one, the game will announce to you that the lock is being taken. To take a lock yourself, units from both players need to be present requiring cooperation to be able to win. It doesn't take too long until all attack wave spawns come in groups where they hit two different random locks. This map requires not only cooperation between commanders, but good map control and multitasking. The ability to send some units to a lock while you're dealing with something else and divvying up tasks is key to playing this map well. The bonus objective is a Zelmaga construct that you are asked to kill. It does fairly decent splash damage, but otherwise exists to divert your army from maintaining map control. For advanced players, this is the fastest map in the game. Getting the locks doesn't take long, and the static bases defending such aren't the most formidable thing in the game. However, the effort the enemy will put into recollecting locks as well as these split attack waves can drag the mission on longer than you'd expect and is one of the very few missions that can be played indefinitely if desired. The two enemy bases also happen to have resources, but mining these is incredibly unnecessary. This map is based on Temple of Ascension from Legacy. Chain of Ascension is a controlled type map. After Alarak became High Lord of the Tal'Darim, his first descendant Janara gets challenged to Rakshir for her title by a faction still loyal to Amon. You must support Janara and defeat Amon's champion. The announcer is Janara. And so ends Rakshir. What a pathetic display. When the day comes, I hope Alarak proves to be a more fitting challenge. The way this works is you must escort Janara all the way from the top of the map to the bottom of the map. When both players have a unit within range of Janara, she will gain power and push the challenger. If the enemy brings any units within range, their champion will gain power and push. If both commanders have a unit within range along with the opponent, then it will balance out and they won't move. If only one player has units at the objective, it effectively counts as none. She will not move forward or counteract enemy units. Upon the forward progress, enemy hybrids will spawn in specific locations. These hybrids will slowly push back the objective until disposed of. These spawn by either having enough time pass, or the objective being pushed far enough to activate them, whichever comes first. This mission requires strong teamwork and map control. You cannot win without your ally contributing at least a spare unit to the objective. Meanwhile, various attack waves will spawn outside of this main forward push, requiring you to split your forces to knock out various threats at once. The general path the objective takes is well guarded. 
there are a lot of dangerous units in these defended positions, and this map happens to have some of the strongest enemy attack waves around. In particular, the second enemy attack wave and the first hybrid spawn are extremely strong for how early on they appear in the map. As a result, this map has the hardest early game in all of co-op, at least in my opinion. The bonus objectives are slain elementals that are just sort of chilling around. They are slightly out of the way flying units whose ability to stun your army mercilessly makes it one of the more obnoxious bonus objectives to kill in the game. Something else to note is that this map is the first of a long line of maps that doesn't have rocks obstructing your expansion, but rather enemy units. This makes getting your expansion early more difficult for certain commanders and is something to take into consideration. From this point on, only one map maintains the original rock obstruction for the expansion, and therefore this enemy defense will be the assumed standard unless specified otherwise. This map also has different announcer dialogue if you play Alarang. The Taldarim are at odds with each other, High Lord. A faction of Amon worshippers seeks to stage a coup via the right of Rakshir. We both know this cannot stand. I must win this challenge. And to do that, I need both you and your ally to support me psionically. This map is heavily based on Rakshir from Legacy. The Vermilion Problem is a control type map. On the planet Viridian Prime, Amon somehow made the planet unstable, causing lava surges. My boy Valerian Mengsk tasked the commanders with collecting xenon crystals to stabilize the planet using the environmental stabilizer. Amon's forces are attempting to stop you. The announcer is Donnie Vermilion. The Dominion's allies are victorious, but was plundering Viridius natural resources worth it? The biggest thing about this map is every now and then, the lower ground area will flood with lava. This does heavy damage to all allied ground units. The enemy units can somehow walk through this just fine. And with lava spouts shooting out, it also does heavy damage to air units as well, though this can be countered with good micro. Once the lava recedes, it leaves by a few crystals. These crystals can spawn anywhere on the map, lower and higher ground. Though there are general chunks of areas they tend to spawn in, and while some crystals are more consistent than others, any crystals that are on the lower ground when the lava rises are lost forever. When you bring a crystal back all the way to the stabilizer, the time remaining increases. Get 20 in total to win. Let the timer hit zero, you lose. This mission emphasizes map control. Clearing out upper ground sections from enemies so you can swoop in later and pick up crystals, meanwhile keeping track of where your army is respective to not only the lava, but attack waves that may cut you off from given said lava. Enemy attack waves tend to bundle up, hitting you from multiple sides at once, while all crystals get a small enemy defense preventing you from running up and collecting it without a fight. The bonus objective is a flamey boy, minding his own business, menacing innocent people. He only appears when the lava is risen, so you must move in advance to kill him. This map is based on the Devil's Playground from Wings. Missed Opportunities is a control type map. Egon Stetman was deployed to Belshir to study the effects of Terezine and well... During the End War, he came under attack from Amon and called upon the commanders to assist in harvesting more Terezine than escaping. The announcer is Stepman and as such has unique dialogue if Stepman is one of the commanders. My bots are heading back to base. We have to be careful. It's a jungle out there. Oh, <laughs> it is. The objective is to escort the harvesting bots to the Terezine shrines and protect them from continual attack waves. These attack waves have clearly defined spawn points, so clearing the general path to the drone and then camping out their spawn points is a reasonable strategy, but most of the time it comes down to covering the drones themselves. The bonus objective is that special structure, the Belshir gliders, are being used by Amon to extract Terezine and need to be killed. These objectives are always on the map and have a countdown timer activated by either enough time passing normally 
or an allied unit entering proximity earlier on than that. When attacking the bonus objective, the countdown timer for the bonus pauses, which is a weird feature but helps cover timing as the first bonus objective reveals itself around the same time the third wave of drones will be sent out on the opposite side of the map. This map is generally regarded as the longest map in the game. While there are other maps that can take longer given poor performance, this map has no way to speed it up. The drones themselves take their good sweet time to finish and has the most downtime of any mission in the game. It is not uncommon to have a max supply army with every upgrade purchased before the last wave of drones are sent out, leaving you and your ally to sit around in peace. There is an enemy base to kill but no resources to find there. This is also the last map added that has rocks blocking your expansion. This map is based on Welcome to the Jungle from Wings. Minor Evacuation is a siege type map. A Kelmorian Combine Mining Colony came under attack from Infested and Amon's forces. The process of activating the evacuation ships lures the Infested to them, requiring you to protect the ships until they launch. The announcer is Guildmaster Debra Green. Alright, that's everyone. Let's get on out of here. Thank you, Commanders, for everything. There are two ways that ships are set to launch. Enough time passes or you activate them with a unit. The next ship to launch will be broadcasted to you where it is beforehand and when the preparation starts. You're only allowed to lose one ship. Defending the ship lasts two minutes each game time, requiring protection from various kinds of infested units, hybrid later, and regular enemy composition units every now and then. While you see attack waves come after you and the ship every now and then, the number of infested easily outstretches anything else thrown at you. This map fundamentally comes down to developing defensive lines against large onslaughts of units at various points on the map. While you will occasionally see statics used to accomplish this, the reality of needing to rebuild that defense for the next shuttle usually leaves it that most players utilize a strong defensive army. Siege tanks and lurkers perform very well on this map, and generally any option that does good splash will prove helpful. My least favorite commander for this map is Zagara, being that she struggles in handling sustained waves of units with her disposable melee army. There are two different bonus objectives on this map. Blightbringer, which spawns adds and deals heavy splash damage, and the Eradicators, which each specialize into killing air or ground respectively. The Eradicators specifically are probably the most ruthless bonus objective to kill on any map, with the anti-ground one basically hard countering ground units, leaving most armies with large wounds at best performance. Usually call downs, clever micro from a hero unit, or just dedicated air units are the go-to way to kill these things. Interesting thing to note is that the Eradicators activate on a timer, but they always exist on the map, which can't be said for the Blightbringer. Hitting the Eradicators before they can fight back is a valid forward-thinking strategy to taking them out. This map is heavily based on Night Terrors from Nova Ops of all things. Dead of Night is a siege type map. On the Terran world of Chasington, there was a virulent Zerg infestation. Unable to stop the spread independently, the commanders are called in to stem the outbreak. For whatever reason, Amon is supporting the infested and attempts to kill you alongside them. The infested can only come out at night. The announcer is Lieutenant Rosa Morales. That's the last of it. The planet's saved, commanders. And we have you to thank. The first interesting thing to note is that this is the only map without an expansion. To compensate, the number of mineral nodes and geysers available is increased, but still below what you would have had with a dedicated expansion. As a result, this map somehow has both the most and fewest resources you can collect. Capping your economy can be done immediately, and getting that done early has significant payoffs to your early game, letting you get more out faster than most other maps, but at the cost of hurting you in the long run. The map runs on a day and night cycle. At night, the infested attack. 
For night one, they only attack the front. For night two, they attack the front and the back. For all other nights, they attack all four sides. The infested also get various special units that can be deployed in their armies. Spotters, which are an anti-static unit and more of an annoyance than a threat. Hunterlings, which are the bane of any day one player as they ignore the frontal choke point and just jump into the top player's mineral line unabated. Kaboomers, which do heavy splash damage. Chokers, which are the bane of players relying on high value units as they stun them and kill them with their tentacles. And later stinks, which are souped up ultralisks and occasionally nidus worms deploying enemy waves against you. The more nights it takes, the stronger the infested waves become. Of course, you can't just defend on this map and win. Across the map, there are infested structures supported by the occasional enemy fortification. To win the map, all of these structures must be destroyed, and given there are no infested spawning during the daytime, that is the expected time to do the attacking. The bonus objective to this map is a viral phage, spawning only at the nighttime and varying in location depending on what buildings you have cleared or not, requiring you to leave the main base with some army to take it out at night. There are various types of approaches that can be taken to handling this mission. The most common I've experienced involves each player taking different directions of the infested structures and then defending separate sides. One player takes the front and maybe their side should it run up to night 3, while the other takes the back and their side. Another common strategy is specialization. One player dedicates to handling defense, leaving the other player to continually attack even at night. In this manner, statics are very good and a P2 Swan is a very nice partner to have if you have a solid offensive core. The third method you occasionally see is pure offense. Just rush the map, defense be damned, and you can occasionally take them out before they take out you, though this is basically reserved for speedruns. Occasionally you'll also see two players dedicated to defense, which helps on some mutations but leaves the map taking its good, sweet time. A couple niche options like Minx's Bombardment and Horner's Bombers are very good on this map and as a result it is probably the most versatile map when it comes to strategies in the game and is easily one of the more popular ones. This map is heavily based on Outbreak from Wings and the Blizzard produced arcade map Left to Die which was basically just Outbreak from Wings. Scythe of Amon is an assault type map. All right, let me explain this. A Nerezine scout tracked the operations of Amon's forces to a Zelnaga temple? Once there, he discovered that Amon was using void slivers to summon a void shade hybrid, the ultimate end game hybrid. In response, he called in the commanders to destroy the Void Slivers and ultimately the Void Shade Hybrid. The announcer is Lyrak, the Nerezine Scout, mentioned earlier. We have done it. The evacuation was a success. My thanks to you. This map is, in my opinion, the hardest map in the game. There are five Void Slivers. Each Void Sliver spawns Void Rifts. These Void Rifts spawn Void Shades. Fake units from the Void to protect the Slivers. There are five Slivers to kill. Each Sliver gets stronger upon the last one killed through various factors. Stronger and more common abilities will be cast such as the Stun, the Shock, and the Death Grip Crystals, which I hate so much. Practically all of these seem explicitly designed to kill high-value armies like Nova's, which gives her a particular struggle on this mission. You can kill Void Rifts to get the units to stop spawning, but the Rifts eventually come back if the Sliver is still there. And the pile of units at these objectives are fear-inspiring. Multiple battlecruisers for high single target damage 
multiple sources of splash, almost no army has a good time pushing in relying mainly on massive bulk and screen nukes to clear these out with any sense of security. Other niche options like Manx Bombardment also works, though you rarely see this used. To add insult to injury, all three races will be used against you. While attack waves still specialize like other maps, you will find that not only does Void Rifts create units from all three races, but the general fortifications fall from all three as well. You are guaranteed to go up against the toughest units you could possibly find in co-op every time you play this map. Another unfortunate feature is the bonus. A warp prison sent to shuttle out the surviving Protoss civilians of the area. This not only requires whole extra sections of base to be knocked out, but requires an escort through otherwise avoidable fortifications and a few slivers. This bonus objective is also extremely unforgiving in its timing. While it announces itself much in advance, it tends to leave far before most players would want it to, and generally corresponding with a spawned attack wave on its side to kill it. This is without a doubt the most missed bonus objective in my experience with this mode. The timer on this map is also fairly short. Killing a sliver increases the amount of time you have left until you lose. This ultimately results in assaults from unprepared armies into a sliver because the timer is ticked too far down and you have no choice but to. The expansion is located at one of the slivers, but it's not the sliver that the bonus objective will first fly through. As a result, you can rush your expansion first and get more resources early at the cost of endangering the bonus. This map is heavily based on the host from Void. Malwarfare is a control type map. A purifier facility has been recently brought online. AI personalities along with it. A Taldarine warrior that was digitized ended up corrupting the system and summoned holographic warriors to defend himself from being purged from the system and thereby murdered. The commanders were brought in to escort a purifier to purge the existing security terminals of the AI. The announcer is Aurora. All systems are under our control, and do not fret. We will never attempt to convert another Taldarium warrior. Most of the map is defending the objective against continual attack waves spawned around it. There are some enemy fortifications in the path of the objective, yet most of them are just sorta around them, and exist to conflict with you reacting to the suppression towers. Suppression towers are these towers that directly attack and stun the objective, requiring you to kill them to progress. They have a stun and damage move that requires Micro to get around, but otherwise the armies spawned next to them are the bigger threat. Once Aurora finishes purifying a terminal, they will get a short amount of downtime in which the objective repairs itself. This map is noteworthy for a few reasons. First reason, the attack waves, while the spawned units to attack the objective are formidable, the waves designed to attack your base are very scarce. There are only three times in the whole map where an enemy attack wave is spawned to attack your base, to varying degrees of predictability. The third and last wave always spawns in the same spot, and therefore can be countered very efficiently. Second reason. The bonus objective is the only bonus objective that requires resources. You must buy multiple AI personalities before they're lost forever. Once the first AI is bought, three smaller waves of units will be spawned to destroy the bonus objective building. Upon killing the three waves, you can just leave one unit for vision and finish buying the rest without resistance. There are two times this objective comes up, six AI personalities to buy in total. Third reason, this is the only mission where you don't fight Amon. The enemy is a giant pile of light holograms unrelated to Amon in any direct fashion, which is unique for the contained storylines in co-op. This map is loosely based on unsealing the past from Void. The objective is similar, but the general aesthetic and map design is largely different. Probably the most unique map in all of co-op from its inspiration. Heart and Parcel is an assault type map. Mobius Corps has captured a Dominion research base and is using it to breed advanced hybrid. 
the commander gets called in to destroy these hybrid along with the assistance of a prototype mech, the Valius. The announcer is General Carolina Davis. That's right. We'll stamp out every last one of these traitors. There are two core parts of what you are doing on this map. Prepping the Valius and killing the hybrid. The Valius is prepped by collecting parts throughout the map. Mostly these parts can be found in various neutral buildings, though the occasional bot will be there to drop a few. Upon collecting parts, the amount of time left until you lose increases because the original way didn't convey how close to losing you were, apparently, so they added this mechanic. Once enough parts are collected, the Valius eventually starts towards the hybrid. These hybrid are beasts. They have multiple abilities, all of which you need to keep an eye on. The most common I see is this area of effect static move, like Phoenix's Arbiter. From there they can create adds, split himself into multiple different hybrid, lock onto a specific unit to do massive damage, all of Mal Warfare suppression towers, pee all over the battlefield which does huge passive damage to all your army, all the while being a formidable boss monster with a large health bar and good single target damage. You need to kill three of these. The goal is to collect enough parts for all three runs and kill the hybrid. The Valius is necessary to bust out the hybrid, but if we're being real, is almost a non-factor in actually killing it. You mostly rely on the commanders to carry the weight there. Side note, if the Valius is killed before it reaches the hybrid, it will do a quick strafe run and cut it loose before leaving for repairs. The bonus objectives are some of the more obnoxious. They are two trains carrying Mobius research that you are asked to destroy. The problem is the first train spawns notably fast and has a notable high HP to boot. If your commanders aren't up to snuff, you're missing the first train. The second train is much later and generally easier to hit as a result. This map is not based on any campaign maps, but rather a fan-made one. Back in 2017, there was a Design a Co-op Map Contest. This map is a modified version of the first place winner of said contest. The original map was created by Buzzwoolly. Cradle of Death is an assault type map. A Dominion ghost investigated a Mobius core base and found a massive battle station secured with mysterious Zelnaga tech. To combat this, he found Zelnaga artifacts that disrupted these defense systems, allowing for the whole base to be destroyed. The commanders are called in to facilitate this happening. The announcer is Agent Stone. Looks like Amon's minions have found your truck's location. Expect an attack soon. The way this map works is that you are given trucks. These trucks do not count as combat units and therefore F2 does not include them. When a truck is in range of a Zelnaga construct, it disables the construct. You can only disable one construct at a time. If your truck is destroyed, another one will shortly be built at base. A construct can only be damaged if it's disabled. The idea is to escort the trucks through the enemy base, pushing to the end where both players position their trucks in a key location, causing that entire section to explode. The bonus objective is a minor application of this. A bit off the beaten path, there will be a Zelnaga construct defending what is contextualized as Mobius Core evacuating weapons data. Bringing the trucks there will destroy this data. The premise of this map is very simple. Push into the enemy base, destroy them. The usage of a map specific unit makes this a bit more micro intensive, but ultimately it's not that big a deal and certainly one of the more unique maps in the mode. It's also heavily regarded as the hardest map in this mode. While I personally say Scythe of Amon is harder, there is a lot of aspects about this map that are troubling. The fortifications are a bit fiercer on this map than others you will find a lot of dangerous units, and depending on what sections you happen to get, you may be required to push very far in. You'll occasionally encounter two constructs next to each other requiring you to either tank the damage, 
or coordinate your trucks with your ally. The biggest thing people have a problem with though are the attack waves. This map loves attack waves. You get them a lot. Regular attack waves directed to your base occur with extra attack waves spawned on the side directed towards your trucks. Exacerbated by the position your base is in, the very center of the map, any spawned attack waves don't require that much time to actually reach you. The end result of all of this is a very busy mission. The effort required to move your units out and hit the objective are conflicted by a necessity to cover your base from constant attacks. Statics are a possible solution to this issue, but what it usually comes down to is one player sticking back and taking out attack waves, while the other player powers on. Special mention goes to commanders with teleports as they permit quick responses to attack waves. This map is based on the second place winner of the previously mentioned contest. The original map was created by Justin the Skunk Purdy. Alright. So that's just about everything. All the available commanders and all the missions they can play. There are some minor topics of note not directly addressed. Varying difficulties result in varying changes, all of which you'd probably expect. The lower difficulty, the slower the game mode, weaker the enemy compositions, and easier the actual objectives, such as more time on the Vermilion problem, and less life for the trains on Oblivion Express. There are also achievements specific to co-op, which are character specific or general progression based, such as win so many games or reach whatever level. The last thing there is to discuss about this mode is probably the most contentious addition, mutations. You see, over time people have gotten very good at all of the maps in co-op. The issue with increasing the difficulty was that increasing the number of enemy units was a fruitless endeavor. A screen nuke that killed the brutal difficulty attack wave would have killed an even bigger attack wave. As a result, there was little point in their mind to increase difficulty in that manner. Their solution to this issue came originally in the manner of the weekly mutation. Every week there is an updated weekly mutation. This would be some regular co-op mission with pre-planned mutators on it. Now mutators are map modifiers, an effect designed to make the map harder. Over the course of the mode more and more mutators have been added into the game, ending with a total of 63 different mutators you can encounter, with a couple unused in the game's coding. These mutators are placed onto specific maps, and these are called mutations. There has been, from my count, 174 unique mutations over the course of the game. Original mutations have since stopped being produced, as we have since looped back to the beginning of the list and operate from there. Some maps weren't around when mutations were first added, so some maps are more prevalent than others. Weekly mutations themselves are a bit disadvantageous to play for leveling up. Because they're on a present map, you don't get your random mission bonus from playing the regular game. The big reason you play weekly mutations are the bounties. There are four bounties to be collected each week connected to the four difficulties. Be a higher difficulty and the bounties for the lower ones get collected as well. When completed on brutal difficulty, the amount of XP received is roughly a fifth of what you need to level a commander from level 1 to level 15, and more than enough for a guaranteed level up in ascension levels. Once you collect the bounties for a week, you cannot recollect them. Bounty totals are connected to accounts and serve as a sign for how long a player has been playing and how competent they are. The general mutators themselves can be classed into varying effects. First is Avoid the Circle. Effects occur throughout the map and you need to micro your units away from them. Orbital strikes, nukes, tornadoes, etc. Another kind is providing an enemy buff. These vary from increased range, speed, cloaking to more unique effects like auto reviving from death and casting a plague upon death. A third kind is Enemy Spawn. These can vary from more attack waves and infested terrans casually spawning around the map to more unique problems like void reanimators, 
propagators, a laser drill, missiles everywhere, and turkeys. A fourth kind is impairing the player. These vary from reduced vision, reduced rate of mining with spawned resource nodes to supplement, enemy hero units temporarily freeze your units from being able to attack or use abilities, your available supply being split with your ally, your units experiencing fear upon taking damage, and many other effects. The best part of mutations is the pre-planning. Certain maps perform better with certain commanders and varying strategies work better for varying mutations. A couple examples for this. The mutator microtransactions makes issuing orders cost resources relative to the cost of the units ordering them. Using Stukov goes very far with this mutator as you can build a ton of infested marines and order them around with a Psy Disruptor rather than individually. Darkness keeps previously explored areas blacked out on your minimap when out of view. The big disadvantage of this one is the loss of seeing where attack waves are and where objectives spawn, such as the crystals on the Vermilion problem. This issue is counteracted by a variety of measures, carefully placed observers, creep tumors, or stetolites all the stepmen. Killbots are immortal killing machines, requiring you sacrifice a defined number of units for them to kill before they go away. Commanders with a lot of disposable units like Zagara are great at getting units to satisfy this. We Move Unseen cloaks all the enemy units, but is easily countered with a commander with easy detection like Nova, so on and so forth. The best this mode gets involves strong forward planning, preparing good counters to what will be thrown against you. That all being said, this mode is contentious for a reason. A lot of mutators are outright hated. Special mention goes to Fatal Attraction, which sucks in your units every time you kill an enemy unit, which basically makes Micro impossible. Double Edged, which makes all your units take equal damage but heal outside of combat, basically making any burst damage and splash horrifically bad. Void Rifts will pop up across the map way too much and produce way too many units. Microtransactions for basically punishing you for playing the game. Avengers for just how significant a buff it gives to enemy units. Vertigo for being so physically painful to deal with that it was only used once and never again. So on and so forth. A giant chunk of the available mutators is heavily despised by a significant portion of the player base. When most players don't want to deal with most of your mode, there is something wrong. The worst this mode gets can be found in one specific mutator that pops up a lot. Chaos Studios. This mutator randomizes the mutators of a match and cycles through them. Over the course of the mode, with stronger mutators being added, this specific mutator has become ridiculous. It is not outside of likelihood to play for so long then suddenly get a mutator combo that is so ridiculous that you basically just automatically lose. Since the mutators are all so random, it's impossible to plan for them ahead of time. Wheel of Misfortune turned Wheel of Stupidity is the worst this mode has to offer. That all being said, even forward planning doesn't go that far as mutation combos can get ridiculous. Custom mutation is also an option when playing with a friend. You can queue up a ton of mutators if you really want to. Right. Hey, crap! Ah, no! Okay. okay, well, there, there are none. <laughs> I, thought, I literally was, just clicked orbital strikes. Do we have orbital strikes? Okay, I guess it's Not just orbital news. strikes. Whatever. Can we beat the map with only orbital strikes? <laughs> you arrived just in time, commanders. I, I literally thought start game was the insert mutator button. Celestial locks. Whatever. No. You want to re wanna re 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 redo this? Better custom. No, it's fine. Well, you just said a mutator, and we got a mutator. So. <laughs> we did get a mutator. That is that is indeed correct. <laughs> the other way you can encounter mutators is brutal plus. Brutal Plus is a difficulty above Brutal and gives an even higher XP bonus. Brutal Plus requires a level 15 commander, and Brutal Plus levels higher than 1 requires a friend. The way Brutal Plus works is every mutator in the game has a Brutal Plus score. Depending on the comparative strength of the mutator, you get a higher score. Brutal Plus does not include Chaos Studios, Vertigo for obvious reasons, and holiday-specific mutators like Afraid of the Dark or Turkeys. 
each Brutal Plus has a higher score threshold and therefore can include not only more mutators, but stronger ones as well. You will encounter two to four mutators in this mode. There are a couple problems with Brutal Plus. First, the mutators are random. You cannot prepare for them like you could with weekly mutations unless you choose to operate on Retry Brutal Plus for some reason. The second issue is that Brutal Plus difficulty scaling is screwed up. There are some viciously strong mutators that have an extremely low cost to this system. I cannot find the replay, but I actively remember getting Fatal Attraction and Double Edged on Dead of Night once. There is a good reason Double Edged and Fatal Attraction were never used for Dead of Night on a weekly mutation. Higher levels are ludicrous in difficulty. There is only one weekly mutation that classifies as a Brutal Plus 6. All their mutations are Brutal Plus 5 at the hardest. To go further, the game recognizes that these higher difficulties are ridiculous and don't allow you to play with random people, meaning that you have to either beg chat or have friends who also hate themselves. And that's it. That's everything to co-op missions. There's a bit more to StarCraft 2 as a whole. Regular multiplayer, arcade maps, the campaign, the story... You swore you'd kill the Queen of Blades. You were the only one who ever believed in me. Do you still believe in me? What we covered was a relatively thorough breakdown of everything in my favorite mode in this game. Links to useful sources of info are in the description. StarCraft2Coop.com, make of that what you will, has the most in-depth collection of information on this mode out there I could find. The linked Google Sheets page has a large record of all mutations and relevant information related to that. And the co-op randomizer gives you an easy way to randomize commanders while removing Abathur from the pool. Thank you for watching this far. Have a good day.